Are you Cal Smith? Good to see you. Hey, Rob, how are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Cascading on the front of the building, but they're also putting this amazing tiles on the front from down there. They have seating, <laughs> shaded, uh, plugs outside, people can charge their phones, uh -huh. and then fountains in the That's his honor. It's fine. It's not a big turn of the point. I've got a head cold on the weekends, so I'm just recuperating. Or it's in the same boat. Right, and it's just been. Oh my she was sick in bed all day. I, I got up and kept going. Yes. But and I think we're, I think we're there. They, anyway, the idea is that you know, they got to oh, put the <laughs> 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 We got budget this week. Yeah. 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 But, but the, the outcome Mine will be over in a, a week. Yeah. Mine will be a lot more painful, trust me. Yeah, 100% So, uh, Stacy Houston, we're going to run into her. She, she's the ADA special project. They're now talking about putting a line on every project, which that's worth more than having you know, police station and intelligence and people in it. But it's, but it, it's so I think that's going to be a stage three step. The first thing is a big, in that open glass area, the mural. And then there is a uh, sculpture stand in the front that has a cut Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order at 7 o'clock p.m. on June the 19th and certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us tonight. Uh, if we just take a moment of silent meditation, please. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. We are privileged and honored uh, to have with us to lead us in the pledge uh, Kayla Beasley. Uh, she is the daughter of Dr. Tamara Conan Beasley and Mr. Darrell Beasley. Uh, she is a rising senior at Hillside High School, ranked number two in her class. Uh, she is the indoor and outdoor track champion, I'm sorry, indoor and outdoor shot put champion, state champion uh, for North Carolina. And and she is the national champion for the Hershey um, no, no, USTA, US track and field. Um, so she's a national shot put champion. And she led the Hillside Girls track and field team to a state championship this year. So we are honored to have Kayla Beasley with us to do the pledge, to lead the pledge. May we stand, please. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. 
Councilmember Davis? Councilmember Johnson? Yeah. Councilmember Moffitt? Yeah. Councilmember Reese? Yeah. And Councilmember Shule? We have several proclamations that we're going to present this evening. Uh, the first recognizes the Neighborhood Spotlight Award recipients for May 2017 and also for June 2017. I'll ask first if uh, Mr. George A. Long Sr., if you would join us, please. George, I don't know if you want to bring in your family or friends with you. I see Ken and... Uh, as most of you know, the Neighborhood Spotlight Award is given, first is an um, award is uh, put together by the Neighborhood Improvement Services. Uh, they're the department that's pretty much all through the city of Durham, neighborhoods and et cetera. But uh, it's put together and it's uh, recognizing individuals who have done a tremendous amount of work in their neighborhoods. Uh, tonight, we're presenting uh, George A. Long Sr. And the certificate reads, is awarded in recognition of valuable contributions to East Durham, serving as the volunteer community liaison to East Durham for the Good Shepherd Church of God in Christ, for coordinating community events, voter registration and fair housing sign up, and for offering support, resources, and information to senior citizens in the area. And it's signed by Thomas J. Bonfield, the city manager, myself as the mayor of the city of Durham, and I want to present this to George. And if you know George, he's all over town. I mean, and he's walking all over town, so he, he gets a lot of exercise. But he's a person that cares deeply about this community. And anytime he has an opportunity to help out, uh, even to offer advice, he, he, he doesn't hesitate to do that. So I'm going to present this to George and for any short comments you might have. On the television, this, it doesn't seem like this many people in here. It must be Trump, one of Trump's things. Right? Anyway, <laughs> now, uh, my name is George A. Long Sr. Uh, I first touched foot in Durham back in 1986 when my brother Kenny was going to North Carolina Central at that time. And uh, my parents moved here like 27 years ago, so I traveled back and forth for 12 years before I moved here 15 years ago from Boston, being there 33 years, 17 years, New York, Connecticut, 50 years up north, so now I'm back almost to Florida, but I stopped here in North Carolina just to, uh, you know, say hello, hi. <laughs> Next is uh, George Goebel, is he, George, John, Wait, I saw, thought I saw John, yeah, okay, good. I know you will. I don't know why I said too much, but whatever. Uh, again, John is the recipient of the Neighborhood Spotlight for the month of June 2017. Uh, this month, John is a resident of the Waterbury Lansbury neighborhood, and he was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work he has done in his neighborhood, including but not limited to leading the city and community efforts to improve the accessibility, safety, and use of Sandy Creek Park by creating a Bird blind, by developing the Monarch Festival, by improving the bridge and trails over the park. And again, we want to congratulate John for being the Neighborhood Spotlight recipient for the City of Durham in, in June. And uh, I can tell you that I know well the work that, that he does. He's been in my office a few times. Planted a tree. Planted a tree, right, <laughs> planted a tree. But a uh, real testament to uh, the type of persons we have in our community. We talk about uh, Durham being a place where good things are happening and it's happening because of residents such as we have here tonight. So John, I'm going to present this to you and for any comments that you might have. Yeah, if, if all you guys that are here supporting John, come on up please. Come on down is the thing, <laughs> if you don't mind.
Uh, first, I'd like to thank Neighborhood Services and the City Council for this award. As uh, Mayor Bell likes to say, a lot of uh, great things happen in Durham, and a whole lot of them are done by volunteers, commission members, board members, and, and the like. Um, they have really facilitated a lot of, I've, what, a lot of what I've done. Uh, the Parks Foundation, Keep Durham Beautiful, the, the uh, county matching grants from DOST, and uh, without those kind of support groups, it would be a lot more difficult for us to do the kind of things we do in Durham. So thank you very much. If some of you were here earlier, uh, you were probably witness an event that we had both as a reception out in the lobby and later in, in the council chambers uh, where we were recognizing the impact that arts is having uh, across the nation, but particularly here in Durham. And I'm going to ask Sherry DeVries and is Senator Mike Woodard still present? Oh, right behind me. I should have known that. <laughs> got your back. Got your back. Got my back. Okay. And Sherry was apologizing early on about uh, the time that it was taken for her to go through a program, but when I saw the figure of the contributions, about six plus million dollars, I said, well, you own this place, so you <laughs> 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 got plenty of time. Uh, Wayne, we, we, we are also doing, I was getting ready to make another presentation, but uh, it, it speaks to the fact that Americans for the Arts, the nation's leading art research and advocacy organization, conducted its fifth benchmark study of the national economic impact of the nonprofit arts or industry and 341 persons that participated uh, in studies across the region in the United States. Uh, it speaks to the fact that the Arts and Economic Impact Prosperity 5 study found that the nonprofit arts industry generates $166.3 billion annually in economic activity. It supports 4.6 million jobs from large urban to small rural communities. And that the nonprofit's art industry annually returns 27.5 billion in government revenues. And whereas arts and economic impact prosperity five study found that the nonprofit arts industry in Durham, North Carolina generates $154.1 million annually in economic activity. It supports 5,700 jobs, and the nonprofit arts industry annually returns about 6.96 million in local government revenue. And that's the 6.96 that I say she's helping pay for this place. But, <laughs> and the 6.397 in state government revenue. And whereas the Arts and Economic Prosperity 5 study collected extensive survey data from more than 14,000 plus arts organizations and 212 plus audience attendees nationwide. And in Durham, from 69 local arts organizations and 824 local attendees, whereas as demonstrated by the Arts and Economic Prosperity Five study, the nonprofit's arts in Durham, North Carolina, substantially contributes to the local economy. And now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim that we support the findings of the Arts and Economic Prosperity Five study, and urge all local, state, and federal officials to not only recognize the economic and social value of the nonprofit arts but to also invest in nonprofit arts organizations directly through their local and state art agencies and the National Endowment for the Arts as a catalyst to generate economic impact, stimulate business development, spur urban renewal, and attract tourists and area residents to community activities and depress the overall quality, improve the overall quality of life in American cities. And witness my hand, the Corporate City of, the City of Durham, this the 19th day of June, 2017. I'm gonna present this to Sherry and she will present uh, your chairman and Wayne for his comments if he has any. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and ladies and gentlemen of the council. It's, um, it's great to be home considering where I usually am on Monday nights. It's good to be with a, a good friendly crowd and to uh, get to see uh, so many good friends in the administration. It's particularly great to be here tonight to talk about the economic impact arts and culture has on Durham. Arts and culture has always been part of Durham's DNA, and, and we do it better than just about anybody. My good friend Barker French, my predecessor as uh, 
President of the Arts Council Board, has a license plate on his card that says Durham, the cultural and arts capital of North Carolina, of the Triangle. But I expanded it tonight to call Durham the arts and culture capital of the state, as we do it as well as anybody. So tonight we had the chance earlier to share with uh, you all the uh, great numbers uh, about the impact arts and culture has on our economy. So I wanted to say to the council and administration, your investment in arts and culture programming is paying back. Sherry's going to share some of the numbers with you, so we thank you as you adopt your budget tonight and as you make important policy decisions throughout the year, your investment in Durham's arts and culture is important for the vitality, the life of this city, but it pays back in real dollars and cents. And you can take that message out to uh, constituents and taxpayers like me and all the folks here and who are watching on TV. So thank you for that continued investment. With that, I'd like to ask Sherry DeVries, the Executive Director of the Arts Council, to share some of those numbers with you all. Good evening, City Council members. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Mayor Bell. Um, Durham is an overachiever in arts and culture. And I just want to recognize we have some of our arts and culture representatives here this evening. If you could stand up, any of you that are still here. Thank you for staying. <laughs> so looking at the overall numbers, total economic activity in Durham. This is the not-for-profit arts and cultural sector. 154,170,023 dollars. Full-time jobs, 5,722. Household income generated, 132 million. Revenue generated for local city and county government, 6.9 million. And revenue generated to state government, 6.3 million. So considering the investment that the government, state, and local make in arts and culture. We're proud to say that we are returning on that investment and hopefully making you proud of, of the arts and cultural community in Durham. Also, the arts and cultural sector in Durham are a tremendous driver for visitors, for tourism in Durham. And just overall, we're very proud of the activity. We've had tremendous growth in our numbers over the last five years. We're up from about 125 million in economic impact to 154 million in economic impact five years later. So thank you so much. And I just want to turn this for a moment to Wayne Martin, of uh, the executive director of the North Carolina Arts Council, and thank him for his support as well. I'm not Wayne, but I, I just wanted to step in before Wayne made his remarks. I had an opportunity to meet this gentleman about a, about a week or so ago at uh, Chuck Davis's funeral. So I'm again at the opening of the American Dance Festival. Again, he's here in Durham tonight, so we're going to get him a room. And <laughs> <laughs> but the, the more important thing is I think it shows the importance and how much of an outreach the Arts Council has and the impact that it's having across this community. But more importantly, how it's recognized at the state the importance of arts in the community. So, Wayne, we appreciate you being here and appreciate your remarks. Well, I'll be very brief. I do also, like Sherry, want to thank all the nonprofit arts organizations here in Durham and Durham County and across the state for all that you do to give our state energy and life and character. And for all the individual artists, those who make their living through their arts and those who um, or do it as an avocation and don't even necessarily uh, designate as an artist, but make music, do visual art, write. You, you are the, the spice for North Carolina that makes people want to come to our state, to live here, to work here, to start businesses. So um, I, I have to agree with the Senator, you, you are the, Durham may be the cultural capital of North Carolina and uh, I'm, I'm certainly, like the mayor said, I, I come here a lot. I come here for shows. I come here to uh, soak up the essential character of Durham and, and Durham County of the Arts here. So uh, congratulations on this study, which shows that you're a state leader. I'd like to invite David Reese, if he's, is David? 
Oh, okay, good. Uh, this recognition is really about our children. It's uh, Durham Kids Save Day. Uh, it speaks to the fact that the city of Durham recognizes that higher education is an important pathway to economic opportunity for children in our community. And it speaks to the fact that evidence shows that children with a savings account in their name are three times more likely to enroll in college and four times more likely to graduate, even if they have as little as $500 in an account. And it speaks to the fact that whereas Durham Kids Save launched in 2015 as a project of the Finance Task Force of the 10.01 Transformation and 10 Initiative to provide savings accounts for children attending school in Census Tract 10.01, Whereas Durham Kids Save automatically enrolls eligible kindergarten and first grade children in savings accounts with $100 in seed funding and subsequently matches deposit in these accounts dollar for dollar up to $100 per year through the fifth grade. Whereas through the first two years of the program, accounts for kindergarten and first grade families at White Smith Elementary School have accumulated over $20,000 through parent deposits earned in census and seed funding Whereas the City of Durham and its partners, including the East Durham Children's Initiative, Self-Help Credit Union, Durham Public Schools, the Corporation for Enterprise Development, and BB&T Bank, remain committed to supporting savings opportunities for children and their families. And now, therefore, I, William Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, do hereby proclaim Durham Kids Save Day in the City of Durham, and hereby encourage all residents to celebrate and participate in programs that promote college savings for the children of our community. What is my hand, Corporate Silver City of Durham? This is the 19th day of June, 2017. I'm going to present this to David uh, as the Executive Director of East Durham's Children's Initiative. But in saying this, uh, I want, want to recognize that this is really an effort that uh, really sort of came out of the effort that we have in terms of reducing poverty uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, year by year, starting in 2014, which we initiated over in Northeast Central Durham. And we had six task force. One was the Finance Task Force, and Steve Shaw, Councilman Steve Shaw, chaired that, co-chaired that, along with former County Commissioner Fred Foster and others involved. But it was an initiative that they undertook. And it's, uh, I think it's really having great promise. It's an initiative that's really started, I guess, out in San Francisco. That's where I first heard about it. But uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, this is a very promising program, and I want to congratulate Steve and the whole task force, but more importantly, the students and their parents who have chosen to participate in this program. So I hope I didn't steal your thunder, but I just want to <laughs> add that to it. <laughs> Mayor Bell, Council, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for taking the steps to have our children back in our community, our larger Durham community, have the opportunity to think about college, to no longer have the, that, that thought in the back of their mind of, I can't afford it. The data says that kids who save, actively save, are more likely to attend school. And so here in Durham, I'm just super proud to say that this is what we do. We go ahead and we put our children first and allow them to have the opportunity to succeed. Councilman Shule, I appreciate you much. Mr. Mayor, thank you. I'm going to turn the microphone up. Oh, you missed something. Uh, we missed something. We missed something. So this is one of our families, and this is one of our families who were super savers. And this is important. This is going to make my day. It's probably going to make their day, but make my day more importantly to be able to take this picture with you. I appreciate you. Thank you for what your investment, right, back in the success of our child. There we go. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, you going to join us? Steve? 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 <laughs> Why don't we go down here? Can we go down there? Yeah. Let's step on down? Yeah. Like we stepped up, stepped down. Councilman Jillian Johnson, if she would 
Come to the podium, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm presenting a proclamation tonight affirming the city of Durham's commitment to reducing greenhouse gases under the 2015 Paris Accords. Um, I'm not going to read the whole proclamation because as our commitment to um, having an impact on reducing climate change is very strong, our proclamation is also very long. Um, but I just want to um, highlight uh, a couple of key points um, that the city of Durham um, desires to protect and enhance quality of life for all those who live, work, learn, and play in our community as well as for our children and our grandchildren. Um, and climate change has been widely recognized by government, business, and academic leaders as a worldwide threat with the potential to harm our economy, safety, public health, and quality of life. And whereas the federal government of the United States has announced the decision to pull out of the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, undermining this critical global effort to confront one of the greatest challenges facing our community and communities all across the one planet that we all share. And whereas in response to this action, the mayor of Durham, along with 1,219 other mayors, governors, businesses, investors, and colleges and universities from across the US signed on to a letter to declare that we will continue to support climate action to meet the Paris Agreement. Let's all give Mayor Bell a round of applause. Um, so we are, as the rest of us on City Council, wanted to also affirm um, our commitment to uh, continuing these efforts under the, under the Paris Accords um, and that we remain committed to our goal of a 50% reduction in greenhouse gases from government and 30% reduction from the community um, by 2030 from the levels um, that were recorded in 2005. And we plan to continue these efforts and also encourage further efforts in the community um, and we have a couple of folks here tonight from our sustainability office to uh, receive this proclamation. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good evening. My name is Tobin Fried. I'm the sustainability manager for the city and county and tasked with um, helping to implement our greenhouse gas emissions reduction plan. And I particularly want to thank the mayor and all of city council uh, for our commitment, Durham was the first community in all of North Carolina to adopt a greenhouse gas emissions reduction plan, and we should all be very proud of that. Uh, to date, the city has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions by 11% from our levels in 2008, so we're um, on our way. A lot of more work to be done, but um, the departments uh, have been doing a wonderful job of trying to reduce our energy use and increase our alternative fuel use and in terms of energy use. So um, I'm very proud of us and I look forward to working with everyone in the city government, the county government, and our community as we continue to work on these really important goals. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Johnson and Tobin and others. Uh, before we get started, could I ask persons that are standing, if you could find some seats, uh, so we won't have to dwell in Thank you. the seats up front and you know, anywhere. And while, while they're doing that, I would ask are there comments by members of the council? Recognize the mayor pro tem. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would just like to share some good news with you tonight and present uh, some officials and um, young men who have been touched by the Salvation, Salvation Army Boys and Girls Club of Durham. So if you will, come up here, Charles, and just share, and your executive director, the good news about the black boys that you're serving and the successes that they have experienced. Thank you. Good evening. First, I'd like to thank the council for recognizing us. I've been with the Salvation Army for about 30 years, 20 years as executive director, 20 years, I'm sorry, 10 years serving on the board. And in those 30 years, we provided a lot of kids, male and female, an opportunity to go to college, go to school, and to better themselves. I also serve on several, several uh, youth committees around the city, include Men of Vision, the Mayor's Poverty Program, several other programs. 
uh, one of the best decisions I made in my life since I left the Salvation Army as an employee was to bring aboard this young man, Joshua Dorsett, I'm sorry, Joshua Dorsett as the executive director. We've had, uh, we've had a, a string of, of uh, successes through Mr. Emmanuel Croslin, who was there before me, and then I had the opportunity to bring Mr. Dorsett above, I'm, I'm sorry, aboard, and since we brought Mr. Dorsett aboard, he's kept, he's kept the home fire burning. We kept kids going to college. He's kept his, his run of, of the mill. We started with his president group we had uh, when they were in the fifth grade. We hung with him for seven years all through high school. And I'll let Mr. Dorsett explain his program because he's done an outstanding job. Joshua uh -huh. Dorsett. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me really quick. Um, so basically, the Salvation Army Boys and Girls Club, we've been in Northeast Central Durham for over uh, 100 years. And to sum up what we do is uh, basically uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of America module called formula, formula for Success, Impact Formula for Success. So basically we take kids who need us the most and put them, pair them up with programs and academic success, character and leadership, and healthy lifestyles. So like Mr. Lyons said, um, in 2009 we started an AAU travel basketball team called Save Sports. And um, basically to make a long story, make a long story short, uh, the kids just graduated um, this year, 2017, and um, a big, big time accomplishment was that we sent uh, all 12 kids to college um, to play basketball on scholarship. <laughs> so uh, I couldn't get everybody, but I got a couple of the kids uh, with me tonight. Malik Frazier, he'll be at Johnson and Wales University starting in August. Deshaun Hicks will be at Fayetteville Tech. Uh, we also have A.J. Davis uh, from Riverside, he's going to Fayetteville Tech. Isaiah Reddish from Riverside, he's going to Barton. Javier Rogers from Kestrel Height will be at Washington Prep Academy. Uh, Rashad Dixon from Southern will be at Fort Union Military. Gerard Bradley from Northern will be a student, just a traditional student at ECU. Jordan Bill of Voyager Academy will be at Concord University in West Virginia. Tamia Williams will be a cheerleader uh, at Johnson C. Smith University. Who is it, Deal? Uh, Jaquan Deal from Research Triangle Academy will be a uh, student athlete at Methodist University in Fayetteville. So uh, that's what we came out to talk about uh, tonight. Thanks for having us. Also, uh, I have my chair, uh, board chair, Dean David Green from North Carolina Central. He does real good work for us. He's with us tonight, too. Thank you. I just want to briefly um, just point out there's so many things going on in Durham. Sometimes we get a lot of discussion about things that are not going well. It is my absolute privilege as an African-American male to see so many young African-American males doing the right thing and going in the right direction. To be able to come today and say that we have 15 of our children going to college. Despite what's going on, they found the path and they found they got on track and they're doing the right thing. And this city council and this city should be extremely proud because this city produced, you supported them, you continue to support them. It makes a statement for the kids that are following. There was nothing more special when we announced that these kids were going to college with the young folks sitting in the audience and they now know they can do it because someone that looks just like them, someone who grew up in their community did it and they know they can as well. So God bless you all. Thank you, Charles and company for coming and sharing that great news. I was impressed that he knew all the kids that were going. <laughs> By name and everything. No notes. Uh, <laughs> That's very key to it also. But Mr. Mayor, what it points to is what you've been telling us year after year after year, the importance of mentoring our children. That is so important, and this is a perfect example. Yeah, let's go there. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Are there other comments by members of the council? Well, that's that's uh, Mr. Protem. Mayor received a Come on, Carla, Silver please. Anniversary Award last Saturday from El Centro on their 25th anniversary. So let's give them a round of applause. 
And, and during the same week, he received the Founders Award from m &F Bank. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> so who knows what he's going to receive next week and the weeks to come. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, let me ask whether priority items first by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. Likewise, likewise city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, city clerk. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we have with us this evening John Rooks, who was recently appointed to the Human Relations Commission. He's here to be sworn in before the city council. Thank you. John Rooks. I, John Rooks. Do hereby solemnly swear. Do hereby solemnly swear. That I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States. That I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of North Carolina. And the Constitution and laws of North Carolina. Not inconsistent therewith. Not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of my office discharge the duties of my office as a member of the human relations commission as a member of the human relations commission so help me god so help me god thank you thank you well thank you john for your willingness to serve and of course we can be of assistance we appreciate you letting us know but we, we know it takes time and uh, it's not always easy to, to give up your time to provide service, but uh, we look forward to your service on Human Relations Council. Uh, I will proceed with the agenda, agenda consists of consent agenda items which <coughs> may be approved with a single motion, uh, unless a council member or member of the audience chooses to pull an item, we'll discuss that later. Uh, the first item is item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two is Citizens Advisory Committee appointments. Item three is the Durham Convention Central Authority reappointment. Item four is the Housing Appeal Board reappointments. Item five is the Durham Homeless Services Advisory Committee appointments. Item six is the Durham City County Environmental Affairs Board reappointment. Item seven is fiscal year 2017-18 budget and 2018-23 capital improvement plan. Uh, Pull that item. We have a person who wants to comment on that. Um, we moved item eight Bloomberg Philanthropic Philanthropies Innovation Team Project Grant. I'm, I'm, I'm not on tonight. Uh, item nine is request to amend the FY 2016 2017 budget and other grant project ordinances. Item 10 is in a local agreement with Durham County for City County Youth Initiatives Manager position. Item 11 is the Housing Authority of the City of Durham request for city loan subordination. Item 12 is the purchase contract for replacement hybrid batteries for the Go Durham buses. Item 13 is the Williams Water Treatment Plant Terminal Reservoir Concrete. Apron Replacement Contract Award to Thale Construction Company, Inc. Item 14 is Professional Services for Lake Mickey and Little River Raw Water Pump Station Improvements. Item 15 is American Tobacco District Water Line Replacement, Amendment Number 2. Item 16 is the Purchase Contract with Musco Sports Lighting, LLC for Sports Lighting at Crest Street Park. Item 17 is Benefits Consulting and broker services evaluation and recommended selection. Item 18 is the fiscal year 2018 agreement to fund economic development programs and services operated by Downtown Durham, Inc. Item 19 is fiscal year 2017-2018 contract for city services and programs for the Downtown Durham Municipal Service District with Downtown Durham, Inc. Item 20 is a contract with Educational Data Systems Incorporated to operate Durham's NC Works Career Center and to provide Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act 
adult and dislocated worker services. Item 21 is a contract extension amendment with Achievement Academy of Durham to provide Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Youth Program Element Services. Item 22 is a contract extension amendment with Community Partnerships, Inc. to provide Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Youth Frame Work Services. Item 23 is a contract SW-45D, Cornwall's Road Bike and Pedestrian Improvements on the tip number U4724. Item 24 is a contract for Southwest-42, North Carolina-55, Cecil Street to Railroad Sidewalk. Item 25 is a revision to City Code Section 70-17 for payment of frontages charge, frontage charges. Items 27 through 30 are items that can be found on the general business during the public hearings. Entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda with exception of item 7. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion. And I I'm sorry, I recognize the mayor pro tem. On item 17. Excuse me. The you, benefits you want to pull that? consulting. No, I just want to make sure that uh, staff got the question that I asked about they are hiring practices because there was one vacancy and he still has no diversity in his workforce. So I just want to make sure that we are vigilant uh, with him and his treatment of vendors of color, I understand, uh, have not been that pleasant as well. Okay, that's it. All right, it's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion <clears throat> indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Let, let, let me go back to, since we only had one item pulled from the consent agenda, and there's one individual to speak on that, let me recognize Chris Tiffany, who pulled item seven for comments, and then we can act on that item as appropriate. Thank you. Half the budget is public safety, 21st century Sorry, Chris, I should have told you, it's three minutes. I'm sorry? You have three minutes. Okay. That's plenty. Half the budget is public safety. 21st century policing in Durham has cost roughly a billion dollars so far. You'd think for a billion dollars, you'd want more information and more control over how all that money is spent and how much is wasted on, let's say, 5% bad cops, paying dozens of bad cops millions of dollars to harass non-criminal pedestrians profiled by age, sex, race, color, class, clothing, or where we live is a waste of time and money, alienating those from whom you need information rather than silence after threats for complaining about systematic harassment in unposted target areas where we need public safety officers who do not harass or threaten public safety. But, well, it's a target area Fear is not respect. The result is protecting ordinary criminals as well as bad cops. And both are typically repeat offenders. The best predictor of behavior is behavior. I'll repeat that. The best predictor of behavior is behavior. Most other women interviewed in your target areas said a cop had called them bitch. How likely are they or their target area neighbors to trust two-faced cops who treat them like that, or worse, you don't even know how often they pull weapons or search pedestrians in target areas with or without force, or how often do cops sick other criminals on people in target areas, like a big dog cop who calls women bitch and threatens complainants and witnesses and their families and pointed at someone near the police chief and barked, that's one of my snitches. Snitches get stitches. I do not like to talk to cops. They're often dangerous and cannot be trusted. Management can't even manage their resources to revise a single mission critical document, General Order 1036, that keeps secret the use of funds to pay for drugs or to pay informants, but fails to clearly protect the identities of your informants. We're supposed to protect people, not throw them to the dogs. Half the budget is public safety, but both public safety and the budget for public safety are literally out of control. Thank you. I recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to comment briefly on the budget. Um, 
Let me just first of all say that we have an absolutely terrific budget this year, and I think it's one we can really be proud of uh, and moves the city forward in so many new ways. And so first thing I want to do is thank our budget department and our department directors, city manager, uh, for the budget that we have in front of us. So I just wanted to hit briefly a few of the highlights, just some of the new things that we're doing that I think people in the city might like to know about and probably don't. We're doubling the dedicated housing fund to $5.5 million to help build affordable housing here in Durham. We're increasing the amount of money we're spending on street paving, which we hear over and over again from our residents is a high priority to $6.5 million this year. We're adding 30 firefighters to the new Station 17, which is people have been waiting for for a long time, which is great. We're greatly expanding our after-school programming for teens at our recreation centers. We're making our recreation center drop-in program and swimming pools free to our youth. We have a 4% average pay increase for our city employees, 5% for public safety, which are critical to keeping the good employees that we want to keep here in Durham. We're advancing the pay of our lowest paid city workers, and one year from now, all of our city workers will be paid at least the $15 an hour minimum. We're having 12 weeks of paid parental leave, which we're adding to the budget. We have launched with this budget a pilot recycling program for organic waste, food, to begin to take food out of our waste stream, and we won't have to ship it off uh, at, at an expensive per pound rate to put it in a landfill in another county. We're working on a pilot for that. We have new educational programs for recycling. This budget establishes an innovation office with three new staff from a grant from Bloomberg. And their first project they'll be focusing on is helping our residents who are re-entering Durham from prison succeed in re-entering. Think how important that is. We have 760 people this last year re-entering Durham from prison and helping them succeed is crucial to our community. This budget has take home cars for police officers living here in Durham. We very much want to encourage our police officers to live here in Durham and this will help do that. This is the second of a three year rollout. It has a new police and fire pay plan and our objective should be to hire the best, pay them well, train them well, hold them accountable and support them for their success, with, to succeed. And this budget, with this pay increase, does that. We just completed, it's not in this budget, but just as of today, uh, this council uh, supported the purchase of Fayette Place, which is now back in public hands. This budget retains a solid fund balance that's well above our minimum requirement and retains our ability to have a triple A bond rating from all three agencies, one of the few cities in America to do so. It provides funding for the purchase of the Duke Beltline Trail, our portion of that, and four other high priority trails. Those are built into this budget. This includes, this budget includes $20 million in the coming several years on new sidewalks and sidewalk repair. And it creates a new city county office on youth with a joint staff member to coordinate and enhance our, our youth activities in the community. It enhances the city's cybersecurity by adding a security analyst to keep our data safe from hackers and other cyber threats, which as you all know is really important now. It provides racial equity training for an additional 150 employees, a diversity recru recruitment initiative so that we can increase the pool of um, qualified minority and women applicants for city jobs. It provides staffing to support the new financial inclusion work, which will help our city residents build their assets it includes $75,000 for public art, uh, up from $20,000 in previous years. And over the next five years, it includes $500 million, half a billion dollars, for water and sewer repairs and construction program that will keep it so that when you turn your tap on, you'll get as much water as you want out of it. It'll be clean and it'll be safe. And we'll also, through that construction program and rehabilitation of our water and sewer system, be keeping our lakes and rivers safe as well. And we'll be spending about $121 million to do that this year to rehabilitate that crucial infrastructure. So these are all new things, um, things that we 
there are many other good things that this budget does, but these are, these are mainly the things I've highlighted are things that we're doing that are new. And I think we can be really proud of the budget. And I wanna thank the city manager and our department directors and the budget department uh, for what is a, a really outstanding budget. And it was hard to get to it, uh, but uh, I think it's really moving our city forward and I'm just most appreciative of it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Steve. You know, we as a council spend time going through the budget and uh, after the administration has made its presentations and we probably take some things for granted, but I appreciate you highlighting that for, for the general public. Uh, recognize, I'm sorry, recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had some comments on the budget, but um, I don't think I could do it any better than my colleague Steve Shul just did. I'll just, uh, what I did want to do is though is respond to Mr. Tiffany's uh, remarks just briefly. Uh, Chris, uh, I think you may be thinking of the, the proportion of the public safety, or the, the portion of the general fund uh, expenditures that are taken over by public safety. But if you look at the entire city budget, uh, public safety takes up somewhere around 22% uh, of the budget. Uh, and though the budget for public safety did increase this year, it increased at a lower rate than the rest of the budget. And so as a percentage of the total budget, it is less than it was last year and less than uh, our peer cities here in North Carolina, such as Winston-Salem and Greensboro spent in the last fiscal, I guess the current fiscal year. Um, would also point out that the overwhelming majority of the increase in public safety this year uh, involved the hiring of 30 new firefighters, which were required to staff a new fire station. Um, Having said all that, I want to just echo uh, what Council Member Shewell said about how strong this budget is, how much I appreciate all the work of city staff, especially the budget department. I um, also wanted to point out something I don't know that we've ever, I've heard members talk about uh, the transmittal letter on the proposed budget, but it was especially strong this year, uh, carrying forward a really strong theme of progress and opportunity in our city, and I wanted to thank the budget staff for their work on that, and of course the city manager as well. Um, I'm especially heartened by the the cities and the city council and staff's uh, recommitment to the uh, dedicated affordable housing fund and literally redoubling our efforts. Um, that does not come free. Um, it, it, it requires an increase in the levy. Uh, we're doubling it this year. Uh, I don't think that's uh, going to be enough over the next four or five years. I think we're going to need to continue to make additional investments in affordable housing, try to make Durham a city where working families can afford to live and work and raise their kids. Uh, but I'm heartened by the step that we're taking today with respect to the Affordable Housing Fund, um, and I know that we are headed in the right direction. Also, just briefly wanted to thank um, our Human uh, Resources Department uh, for making the commitment to our employees uh, to pay, uh, to offer 12 weeks of parental leave. Uh, that uh, puts us uh, in the elite class of governmental employers here in the state of North Carolina. It's something that folks in the community have reached out to many of us about individually, um, and I know I've had some conversations with staff about this over the last several months, and I just really, really appreciate um, our, our staff making that commitment to our employees to be that first-in-class employer um, here at the City of Durham. So again, with that, thank you, uh, Mr. Manager um, and the Budget Department, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for giving me this opportunity. Are there any other comments? I recognize Councilman Moffitt. I appreciate both my colleagues for their great comments. and. To if, if uh, nobody else has any comments, I'll be proud to move the budget. Property moves and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, call the question. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, I recognize Councilman Mark. I, I will make a comment, which is simply that I think it was um, Vice President, or former Vice President Joe Biden who said, don't tell me what your values are, show me your budget. And I'm really proud of the values that, that that's been highlighted and are embedded in our budget and the work that we're doing. That's all. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to wait until the budget was passed before I made any comments since uh, this is my last budget. <laughs> my last over 16 plus 26, I guess almost 42 budgets, somewhere along there. But uh, I, I, I do appreciate all the comments that the, my colleagues have made, and I'm not going to repeat that. We have a strong leadership in our city manager, a strong staff. And it's something I think we all should be proud of. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, the city is in good hands financially uh, through the administration. And I would just hope that as you move forward, we will continue this, that effort. But this is really, uh, the fact is, it's a unanimous budget. 
Uh, in fact, we didn't have to go back to any makeovers. We had a date set up for that, but uh, we didn't have to go through that. And it's all because of the way it was presented. And uh, I don't want you to think that we didn't raise questions because we did that. But having raised those questions, uh, obviously we got sufficient answers to be in support of what's being presented here tonight. So again, I want to also congratulate the administration, the staff, and my colleagues for, for this effort. Uh, let's move to the next item on the agenda, which is the general business agenda public hearings. Item 27, consolidated annexation for 1000 Infinity Road, Village Heart, co-housing community. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, and before I begin, I would like to note that both of our, our planning items tonight have been um, advertised in accordance with state law and the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, the item in front of you presently is a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation petition, and zoning map change, which has been submitted from Village Hearth Co-Housing LLC for a contiguous 15-acre parcel located at 1000 Infinity Road. If approved, the annexation of the site will become effective on June 30th, 2017. The subject site is currently zoned Residential Suburban 20 and Residential Suburban 10 and is also located in the Eno River Critical Watershed Overlay District. The applicant is petitioning to change this zoning designation to Plan Development Residential 2.110. Some key commitments on the development plan included with the rezoning include a maximum of 32 residential units, age-restricted living, um, a mix of unit types with a maximum of 1,600 square feet per residential unit, at a maximum of 24% impervious surfaces. The Public Works and Water Management Departments determined that the existing City of Durham water and sewer mains have capacity to serve this project, and the Budget and Management Services Department determined that the proposed annexation will be revenue positive immediately upon annexation. The Planning Commission, at their March 14, 2017 meeting, recommended approval of this request by a vote of 12 to 0. Uh, further staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and the other adopted and applicable policies. Um, the action on this item will require two separate votes. The first motion includes the extension agreement and the annexation ordinance, and the second motion includes the consistency statement and zoning ordinance. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have at this time. All right, thank you. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Let me ask other questions first by members of the council. If not, we have uh, four persons that are signed to speak on this item. Uh, and I'll say that all four were proponents of the project. Is there anyone that uh, wants to speak in opposition to the zoning that did not sign up? Uh, in that case, let's limit the comments to uh, 12 minutes at the most. Uh, I recognize Pat McNally, James Taylor, Paul Stenson, and Dan Jewell. You all can choose the order you go in. Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, Dan Jewell, uh, Coulter Jewell Thames. If it's okay with you, we may reshuffle that order just a little bit for the speakers, but 12 minutes is plenty of time, so thank you very much. Uh, good evening again, Mr. Mayor Bell. Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden, fellow council members. Uh, I am Dan Jewell, president of Coulter Jewell Thames at 111 West Main. Our, our firm has been asked by the Village Hearth folks uh, to assist them with land planning and design of this site at 1000 Infinity Road for the proposed co-housing community that they very much desire to build. Staff has described the location and the generally outlined our proposal uh, and there are a series of a few speakers, as you know, who will follow me, who can explain much more eloquently uh, what co-housing is all about and the intent of their community, uh, why some of them are choosing to live here, and how they've worked to engage the neighbors over the last many months. What I'd like to do is give you a little more information about what we are proposing to do and what we are not proposing to do. We are proposing to develop an intentional community of up to 32 units. Uh, by our calculations, this is an equivalent density to what the current zoning on the site would allow. The reason for the zoning request 
is to allow us to cluster the units. So rather than having to spread the houses all over the property on uh, the minimum lot size required by the ordinance, uh, they would like to cluster the development. A single family subdivision of the same density would obviously impact much more of the property. The community will be oriented around common open space and designed in such a way as to have much less impact on the land than a conventional subdivision would with the goal of preserving as much of the property and trees as possible. In fact, we have committed to a development envelope on the development plan that is much smaller than would re otherwise be required by the ordinance. We've committed to having none of the residential units be over 1,600 square feet in size, and most of them will be attached. Most of all, our goal is to create a community which is sensitive to the land, sensitive to the neighbors, and still preserves the original appeal of the property which brought the group to purchase the land in the first place. Yes, they've already purchased the property. Uh, you all probably know this is a relatively unusual in this business. Land is generally put under contract and a purchase is not closed until zoning and other entitlements are in place. That's how resolute and how uh, passionate they are about living here and moving ahead on this property. And I think this reinforces the key point. These folks are not developers for development's sake. They're working to create their community that they will live in and grow old in together. The folks in attendance tonight are the ones that will be living here. What we are not proposing is a conventional single family subdivision. The current zoning of the property, RS10 and R20, uh, is already appropriately zoned to do a single family subdivision of about 32 units by right with no zoning, no public hearings, or a vote by you. It would simply be all staff level administrative approvals. Instead, these folks have willingly come to you asking a, for a rezoning to the same density so that they can cluster the homes. We very much understand that the primary neighborhood concern has been about traffic impact on their neighborhood by connecting to the end of Buttonbush Road, which currently dead ends at the property line. This is understandable. The neighbors have enjoyed a quiet dead end street since their neighborhood was created. Uh, I know this well because some 40 years ago, uh, my old partner Ken Coulter did the zoning on this property, uh, which eventually became Eno Trace in the associated neighborhood. Our proposed connection to Buttonbush will add some cars to Buttonbush, but not nearly to the extent that the neighbors fear. Folks who live in co-housing are traditionally older and drive much less than a typical household that might have two people working separate jobs, taking kids to soccer practice, after school activities, all that sort of thing. We have agreed, we have committed, as uh, Mr. Wiggins said, that the community will be restricted to age 55 and older. The city transportation department has confirmed that this will generate less traffic than the right by right single family subdivision could be built on this property would. And that subdivision likely would have a through street from the end of Button Bush all the way out to Infinity Road. The city transportation folks have asked us to construct a city standard cul-de-sac or hammerhead turnaround at the end of Bush, Button Bush on their property with right of way dedicated to the city at their expense. This is to ensure that emergency vehicles, school buses, and large trucks will now actually be able to turn around safely at the end of the street rather than backing all the way up to the last intersection or in some private driveway as they do today. That, again, is a committed element on the plan. Finally, we've also committed, at the request of the neighbors, to require that all construction traffic will use the Infinity Road entrance to the property, not the Button Bush property. So we hope you can agree that we've gone to great lengths to minimize the impact on the property and on the surrounding communities. And for this and other reasons, we would hope you would follow the unanimous recommendation of the Planning Commission and move for approval tonight. I'd now like to ask Pat McCauley, one of the founders of the Village Hearth community, to you speak to you about the vision and the community outreach. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. 
Good evening, council members, staff, and neighbors. My name is Pat McCauley, and I, along with other members of Village Hearth Co-Housing, are planning a small senior co-housing community. While co-housing is different from intent from a typical uh, subdivision, we're not so different from our North Durham neighbors. We're looking forward to our small quality homes where we expect to live for the rest of our lives. Because co-housing communities are self-developed on a small scale, it's our money on the line. There's no deep-pocketed developer nor um, hundreds of units over which to spread the um, significant infrastructure costs. So we're making a real effort to keep our homes as affordable as possible for our members. Um, we couldn't afford property in downtown Durham. We looked for a long time. We found this great piece of land in August of 2015. We wrote a letter to our neighbors, our adjoining neighbors, um, introducing ourselves and letting them know that we were going to work within the existing zoning um, restrictions and would keep them informed. We had a couple of um, inquiries, mostly hoping that we weren't going to build 100 apartments <laughs> on that land. In 2016, Dan helped us prepare for the um, development plan submittal and in May of uh, 2016. And then in June of that year, we invited 115 of our neighboring households to a community information session. We weren't required to host that, but we wanted our neighbors to have a chance to see what we were pr proposing. We located it um, conveniently at the North Regional Library, and four households joined us to find out about the project. Three were supportive, one didn't want us to use Buttonbush as our access. Word spread after that meeting and a total of eight additional uh, neighbors sent us emails welcoming us to the neighborhood, but requesting that we not access our property through the stub on Buttonbush. We offered to meet with each person and did meet with four of those folks. And one of them understood why we were wanting to come in, where the land is the flattest, which is where we plan to build. Many neighbors attended the first public hearing with the Planning Commission, and several spoke against our community. The commissioners wisely requested further clarifications in our development plan and for us to consider our neighbors' concerns. Dan worked to revise the development plan, and we agreed to the concessions that Dan has already described. We held another voluntary meeting with our neighbors, and about 25 households were represented that night. Most were satisfied with the concessions that we had made, but a few neighbors still object to the button book access and expressed their displeasure at the March 14, 2017 Planning Commission meeting. Thankfully, as you know, the Planning Commission had no objections to our revised development plan, and some commissioners even applauded our efforts to work with the neighbors and our design changes. Being a senior community, we're finding that most of our members will have only one car, and we know that we'll do a lot of ride sharing when we do go out. We really won't increase the traffic through Eno Trace by a significant amount. We do recognize that change is hard for everyone, but development is an inevitable outcome of living in a really cool place like Durham, and we did come back here specifically to build this here. Village Hearth Co-Housing presents the best kind of development in this area possible. Instead of a multi-story apartment building, we're adding a small number of really friendly neighbors. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is James Taylor. I live at 14 Hummingbird Lane in Eno Trace. Uh, I back up to this property, and I think this is going to be a great for the neighborhood. Button Bush being a dead end for years trucks backing down there back uh, back and in there's a lot of houses down in there um, what they're proposing everything they said uh, I think would be great for you know trace thank you good evening my name is Paul J Stinson I'm a native and a realtor here in Durham and have held many positions in the Association of Realtors as well as served on the Housing Appeals Board with the city of Durham uh, but to hear I'm here tonight as a member of the Village House, uh, Village Hearth Co-Housing. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about our proposed community, make sure I didn't miss anything here in the last few minutes. Co-housing is a form of intentional community where people agree to be good neighbors and good stewards of the earth. 
Senior co-housing takes this idea further by including smart universal design features to aid in accessibility. We're planning to build up to 32 single-story cottages in close proximity, resulting in homes clustered near a clubhouse. To further construction savings, as well as future energy savings, we're planning to attach our homes in duplexes, triplexes, or quads as they fit on the available land. Building on the flattest part of the land will keep our paths accessible for seniors with cranky knees. Our rezoning request is not to increase residential density, rather to accommodate clustering and attaching homes. In fact, by building only 32 homes, we'll have much less impact, actually far less impact, on the land compared to a typical developer. I think this is even more important down in the um, watershed issue area. Thank you. Okay, that concludes all the persons that had signed up to speak. Dan, you got 12 seconds you want to conclude? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, are there other questions by members of the council? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing and recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm planning to vote for this. I think this is, I wish we had more of these. Um, the, uh, the, the concept is great, and, and I think the idea of having all that green space salvaged and clustering these houses is really, really great. Um, and appreciate your, your, your willingness to work with your neighbors on the, uh, on the, on the button bush issue. Um, my question is, uh, these houses I know are designed to be uh, quite affordable. Uh, we also have a, an affordable housing fund, as you know, from the city of Durham that uh, serves people that are uh, it's predominantly 60% of the below the area median income. And uh, I wondered if you all had considered a proffer to the affordable housing fund, Mr. Jewell. Councilman Jewell, appreciate the, the question and you asking that. Um, I, I had spoken to a few of the members uh, several weeks ago in advance of the meeting that, that this might come up. Um, it, it, as you know, I've had many developer clients that have come before you who have uh, made a proffer and contributed to the Affordable Housing Fund. Those have all been for-profit developers with deep investors who had some backing to, uh, to uh, uh, contribute to that, to that fund. Uh, these folks now that we are a year into this rezoning, uh, even though there's not a design done, they're already really getting concerned about what construction costs have done over the last year and their ability to be able to uh, uh, put these homes together in this neighborhood in the way that, that um, will allow them to meet all the handicap accessibility requirements living in place and that sort of thing. So I, I guess in a in a, in a a nice way what I'm saying is that they look forward to um, doing their uh, annual contribution through their taxes to the uh, uh, fund that you just approved and the excellent budget that the City Council approved uh, but at this time they their limited means they're all folks of modest means they do not have the wherewithal to do a proffer uh, but I will be before you again I'm sure in the future with other projects that will so there's an answer. <laughs> Are there other questions, comments? Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. I'm very excited about my new neighbors in Northern Durham. So welcome even before you get there. Any other comments? Recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to make a quick comment that I think co-housing is a really exciting and innovative way to build um, the development that we need to see. Um, in Durham, I really like the idea behind co-housing um, and that it allows people to live in smaller units and have more shared common space um, and be more environmentally sustainable. So I'm also really excited to see this project come to Durham. Okay, any other comments? Recognize, recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yeah, yes, Mr. Mayor. Based on what I heard from staff, if there are no more comments. I think it's a great idea. I'm ready to move. Yes, so the, the first motion is, to, if I understood correctly, is to approve the annexation ordinance and the extension, utility extension agreement. Second. So, improperly moved and second. 
All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, and then I'll move the consistency statement and the approval of the zoning ordinance. Yeah, yeah. It's, been, it's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Moved item 28, consolidated annexation for 301 Atkins Sites Higher Property. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins, again with the Planning Department. Um, requests for utility extension agreement and voluntary annexation and initial zoning have been received from Pulte Home Company LLC for a 63 acre parcel located at 301 Atkins Heights Boulevard. Um, if approved, this annexation will become effective on June 30th, 2017. The applicant has requested an initial zoning designation of residential rural, which is an exact translation of the existing county zoning designation. Um, if these requests are approved, the applicant intends to construct a conservation subdivision, approximately 90 residential units at the subject site. Public Works and Water Management performed the utility impact analysis, which indicated that the existing City of Water uh, Utilities, uh, I'm sorry, City of Durham Utilities have capacity to serve this project. And the Budget and Management Services Department performed a fiscal impact analysis, which determined that the proposed annexation will be re revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. And as was the case with the previous item, action will require two separate votes. The first being a, the first motion includes the extension agreement and the annexation ordinance. And the second motion includes the consistency statement and zoning ordinance. And I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have at this time. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask other questions by members of the council. If not, we have uh, three people that have signed to speak on this item. Uh, they signed up as two opponents and one proponent. Uh, I'm gonna call the names to make sure we got the right people here. We have Chris Mail, Jessica Englehart, and Tina Sanders Hill. Now is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that hasn't signed up to speak? I'm trying to gauge the time for the item. Okay, uh, let's see if we can take uh, 15 minutes on this at the most, I recognize the opponent, I assume, Chris Mail. Good evening, Council. My name is Chris Mail. I'm a civil engineer with Eden's Land, 2314 South Miami Boulevard in Durham. I'm uh, here on behalf of my client, Pulte Homes. Uh, also with me tonight are Bob Anderson with Pulte and John Blackley from my office, a land planner with, with my office. Uh, don't want to take up too much time. I echo uh, Jacob's, Jacob's comments about the project, 90 units. Um, access to the site is proposed to be uh, to an existing stub street in Oak Haven neighborhood, which is to the east of the parcel. Uh, other, other options were considered, especially to the west. To the west, we have significant floodplain area and a stream. Uh, in order to make a connection through the floodplain across the stream uh, would require a no practical alternatives analysis. And it's, it's our opinion that the, the option that was chosen is a practical option and uh, really the, the only option we have for, for access to, to our site. We also are proposing a stub street to the, to the parcel to the south, currently undeveloped. Uh, if that were to be developed, that would provide an additional access point um, out, eventually out to Herndon Road. Uh, there is an, exi an existing Oak Haven neighborhood I just discussed. Also to the north of Oak Haven neighborhood is a new subdivision. Streets were recently paved. It's called Herndon Trace. And that subdivision will provide a couple of other access points from the Oak Haven neighborhood out to Herndon Road. Um, as Jacob said, water and sewer are available and uh, capacity is adequate. The, um, so so no, no utility extensions are required. Um, 
I think, I think that's, that's about it. I, I would like to say that, that, that my client is willing uh, to make a proffer of $25,000 to the Durham Affordable Housing Fund and made payable prior to the first final plat for this proposed subdivision. I request your, your consideration for this, for this annexation and proposed project, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any questions of the developer at this time? Yes, sir. Uh, Jacob Williams of the Planning Department. I'd just like to point out, since there's no development plan with this initial zoning or an actual rezoning petition, there's no ability to proffer commitments in that manner. Okay. Uh, if that concludes your comments as a developer. Yes, sir. And we have no comments from the staff, I mean, from the council at this time. I recognize those persons who had signed up in opposition to this item, uh, Jessica Englehart and Tina Hill. Well, let, let's, oh, there we go. Let's, let's, let's do this before you start. Uh, we only have two speakers, so are, are you all together? Okay, well, I'm, is it okay if we give seven minutes to one, eight minutes to the other, is that fine? Well, it's a public hearing, so if she wants to sign up to speak, she can speak. Okay. All right, so let, let's, let's go with five minutes for you all initially, and then we'll see where we go. Hello. First, I would like to thank all of you for taking the time to hear our concerns. Address. I'm sorry? Say your name and address. Oh, Jessica Eigelhart, 901 Marchery Road. Thank you. My name is Jessica Eigelhart. I am one of the 43 homeowners in our small community in Southern Durham. Can everyone who came to support us please stand? As you can see, this is important to so many of us. Thank you. I am here today representing my neighborhood Oak Haven. This has been my home for over 12 years. As one of the original homeowners, I have seen Oak Haven transform into our amazing close community with over 50 children. Here is an image from our annual neighborhood egg hunt, which I host at my home on Marchy Road. Higher Residential is proposing to use Marchy Road as their only entrance into their new development, potentially adding 180 or more cars threatening the safety of our neighborhood. This annual event would become extremely dangerous if Marchy Road becomes the only entrance to an additional 90 new homes. Higher Residential's incentive for using Marchy Road as their only entrance to their neighborhood is motivated by their interest in their own finances and not that of a community as a whole. We are requesting the City of Durham to deny the annexation for Higher Residential's plans. We want Higher Residential to modify their plans and use the existing road, Atkins Heights Boulevard, that connects directly to Fayetteville Road as their only entrance to their new proposed development, keeping our neighborhood safe. Marchy Road is the only entrance to our community. Higher Residential's proposal to extend Marchy Road and add an additional 90 homes will turn Marchy Road into the sole entrance of 133 homes and disproportionately affects our existing community, endangering our residents. Our primary concern with Higher Residential's proposal is the safety of our residents, children, pets, and guests. The increase of traffic and speed of vehicles will greatly jeopardize the safety of our neighborhood. In addition, the increase of vehicles and children will make our school bus pick up and drop off location much more dangerous. The width of our roads cannot accommodate the added traffic. Emergency vehicles have challenges maneuvering through the roads as they currently exist. As shown in this picture, the garbage truck had to ask the homeowner to move his trash pails back so the truck could get up the street because our roads are narrow. The current conditions of our roads cannot handle the additional traffic from 90 additional homes. Use of Marchy Road for, her, for higher residential's new neighborhood affects all of us in the community and will cost taxpayer dollars to repair, upgrade, and maintain the road over time. Another concern is having construction vehicles drive through our neighborhood, making our roads extremely dangerous. 
construction equipment will cause damage, excess noise, and debris in our neighborhood, as our roads were not built for the use of heavy construction of vehicles. The additional traffic on Herndon Road from Marchie Road, along with the new developments already under construction, will add more traffic congestion to the small back road. Herndon Road and Barbie Road is a major intersection for many neighborhoods. Currently, with the volume of traffic, negotiating the intersection is very dangerous. Poor visibility and vehicles driving over the speed limit on Barbie Road make it extremely difficult to cross. Allowing Marchy Road to be used as the entrance for another 90 homes, potentially 180 or more cars, will further burden and endanger those currently navigating the intersection. Fayetteville Road is a four-lane road with greater capacity to handle the additional traffic. Again, we want higher residential to modify their plans and use Atkins Height Boulevard as their only entrance to their new proposed development. Do not let higher residential pass their costs along to us taxpayers. We, the residents of Oak Haven, believe the extension of Marchie Road as the primary entrance for higher residential's development would impose undue safety concerns to our residents of Oak Haven and be detrimental to the future development in South Durham area. Please help us keep our neighborhood safe. Having our concerns represented at the city level reaffirms that Durham cares about its residents and is committed to pursue growth in a responsible manner. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tina Sanders Hill of uh, 1503 Carrick Purgis Court, also in Oak Haven. Um, I'm a 10-year resident of Oak Haven in South Durham, and I'm here to ask you to oppose the annexation of 301 Atkins Heights Road. The developer plans to build 90 homes and have only one entry point, an exit point, and that point is Little Tiny Marchery Road in Oak Haven. Oak Haven is home to 43 houses. Marchery Road is our main street, the heart and soul of our neighborhood. It's where our neighbors gather, children learn to ride bikes, and where 18 homes sit on less than a half a mile stretch. The proposed annexation will add 180 plus cars to a road that is only 15 feet wide. Our neighborhood is a racially, ethnically diverse community, a people invested in the betterment of Durham, not just our little Oak Haven, but Durham as a whole. Our community members work in Durham volunteer in organizations such as Mills on Wheels, Porch, Ronald McDonald House, PTA, SEEDS, Girl Scouts, Boy Scout leaders, STEM robotics programs for Durham's children at, uh, Durham's students that are at risk. We love living, and living in and supporting all things that are Durham. Please support the safety and livability of our neighborhood and vote no on the annexation at 301 Atkins Height property. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that has not spoken in opposition? Okay. Um, developers, you have the developer present. You have any other? Where's the developer? Oh. Do you have any other comments that you want to make on this? How, how much time does he have? 11 minutes. Just, just a couple of brief comments. Um, the, the connection to Atkins Heights Road that the residents are discussing, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that would require the, our project to construct a roadway through, through floodplain and across a stream as part of the site plan process through Durham, we would have to submit a, a no practical alternatives analysis if we were to propose such an access point through the floodplain and crossing a stream. And I contend that the, the only practical alternative to that is the proposed access. The ordinance requires interconnectivity between parcels. The reason that Stubb Street is there is to connect to a future roadway. Just, just the same as we are providing or proposing to provide a Stubb Street to the south for someone else to connect to if that project to the south or 
parcel to the south were ever developed. That's the only point I'd like to make. Thank you. I recognize the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could I ask somebody from the Transportation Department to uh, please come up and uh, clarify from uh, the staff's perspective the, uh, the issues related to uh, both access uh, uh, from Martry and the Stub Street as well as the, uh, the Atkins Height Boulevard and any evaluation we've done to date on that? Thank you. Yes. Bill Judge with Transportation. Yes, the uh, development ordinance requires uh, street connectivity to um, existing public right-of-ways as well as connectivity in all four cardinal directions. So um, they, they would be required to connect to, to Marchery Road as well as Atkin Heights Boulevard, although I think there are except exemptions in the ordinance for uh, dealing with steep slopes, floodplains, wetlands, and I believe that's what the applicant has indicated that they're intending to seek through the site plan process is an exemption for making that connect connection to Atkins Height. That's a, uh, through that, so that would be a determination that will have to be made through the, through the site plan review process. And uh, Mr. Judge, could you clarify what's the, uh, w what evaluative criteria you would use to uh, uh, allow only one entrance to a subdivision of that nature in, in this? Uh, yeah. um, so the, uh, the ordinance has a separate section that allows up to a maximum of 90 units with a single point of access. So if it is determined that due to the environmental features that that connection cannot be made or is not required, then they would be limited to the 90 units which they are proposing. And is cost an allowable factor? Uh, not typically. Um, the planning department may better able to answer all the, the criteria because it's a combination of transportation, environmental, planning, stormwater factors that they're looking at when making that determination. Thank you. Let me ask are there other questions or comments on, on the side. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, uh, Mr. Judge. Um, I wanted to ask, you said that the ordinance allows 90 units to be um, connected with a single connector. Yes. Is, is that in sequence? Because it looks to me like the, 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 well, the development it would be connecting to has at least another 30 homes that are on a single connector. So could you just continue to stack up 90 unit so, projects? No, yeah, the cumulative impact of development is taken into consideration. Right. Uh, the, there's another development that's currently under construction that has that just to the north of the Marchery Road, Oak Haven, that Adeline Court that you may see on uh, the context map. Right. Um, so they would be limited. I believe there's 43 in the existing neighborhood, so they would be limited to no more than 90 plus including the 43 until such time as that second connection was made um, Adeline Court which is under construction now <laughs> but we're but talking then, about somebody adding another 90 homes to their single correct, connection but so in once, addition to the 43 and the I know but once Marchery Road is connected to Adeline Court then the not where the 90s calculated gets basically calculated right there at the at the property line of at Marchery Road in the proposed development rather than Marchery Road and Herndon Road because so it sort of shifts where the 90 gets calculated from. Okay, thank you. Would I be able to comment? Just, just, just a minute, please. Sure. Uh, are there other comments or questions by recognized Councilman Shule? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, So the, could you say a little bit more, or I guess I would like to hear from uh, the planning department um, in terms of staff's recommendation and uh, any comments that you could add to what Mr. Judge had to say about uh, the potential to use or not use Atkin he Atkins Heights Road? Sure, thank you, Council Member Shul, Pat Young with the planning department. Um, as Mr. Judge has indicated, uh, the UDO does allow uh, and in fact requires connection to Marchery Road uh, so that we can have a coordinated transportation system. In order to not connect to Marchery Road or to Atkins Heights, they'd have to either close the terminal connection to Marchery Road or close Atkins Heights. What the applicant has indicated to us is that they wish to close um, Atkins Heights on their property 
and connect to Martry. And they're allowed to do that under the ordinance if you all approve this action. Um, certainly, uh, if there was a uh, development plan, they, we, uh, and they were to proffer improvements to Atkins Heights, they could also close Martry and have sole access through Atkins Heights. The, the issue, and I'll let Mr. B Judge speak to the technical aspects of this, are that um, the Atkins Heights is not uh, in any way, shape, or form developed to a current public standard, so they would have to voluntarily proffer to improve that to a public standard, or the city would have to improve it to a public standard in order for it to be an appropriate access point for this property. Because uh, as you get off of, off of this site, um, it doesn't even appear that there's uh, adequate right-of-way. There would have to be additional right-of-way and the road would have to be improved and there's no way administratively for us to require that to be done off-site. Does that help answer your question? It does. I have another question. I'm not sure I understood all of it, but I think part of what I heard was that they, you can't, uh, we can't require them, or the city could not require them to improve Atkins Heights because it's going through, partially would be going through land that's not theirs. Is that right? That's correct, because the, the, the scope of this development did not uh, trigger a TIA transportation impact analysis, which is the tool and mechanism we use to, um, cu coupled with development plan zoning, to require off-site improvements. And that's not uh, available here. So staff approval of this, or staff recommendation for this, um, how is, is based on, uh, is, is it in part based on the staff's belief that Marjorie Road is, the, is an appropriate uh, um, uh, a road, f you know, s a single outlet for this uh, subdivision? Yes, sir. As you've heard from Mr. Judge, Marchery Road is a city uh, maintained, city accepted street that's been accepted within the last 10 years. Atkins Heights is a, a substandard platted right of way that is only marginally improved off site. So the connection to Marchery is the one that um, the ordinance would allow without any further improvement and that we could um, require connection to without um, any off site improvements. And would you say that? Uh, this is um, the the neighbors are understandably concerned. They have a their neighborhood is uh, is happy with the situation that they're in. This will bring them more traffic. Um, I live on a busy street. I know what more traffic can be. Um, I wondered if you would uh, comment on, uh, or maybe Mr. Judge could comment on. I know you all haven't done a, a TIA on this, but. Uh, would you anticipate that the amount of traffic on this road would be any, in any way atypical of what we see in Durham in situations like this? Uh, could you comment on that? I don't believe it would be atypical. I'll let Mr. Judge characterize the estimated impact of the proposed development. Yeah, uh, Bill Judge, transportation. Uh, a typical residential single family house generates about nine and a half trips per day. So the, the 90 units would generate, yeah, um, yeah, a little less than um, 900 trips per day. Um, so, I mean, that the street, from a capacity standpoint, is more than adequate for, for handling that traffic. Um, so it, it just becomes, but we do encourage street connectivity and uh, for routing and services and school buses as well as, yeah, city services. Are there other recognized Councilman Davis and Councilman Reese in that order? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask Mr. Judge if he could uh, answer a question that was raised when Ms. Englehart, um, is this correct? Englehart, um, um, spoke about the narrowness of that street. Um, is parking allowed on both sides? Um. I believe parking is currently allowed on both sides, although um, if we do have ongoing issues with either vehicles parked, um, we can on, upon request from, from the residents enact parking restrictions on, on one or both sides of the road, but typically we try not to do that until there's actually an observed problem so that people and uh, residents and their guests have a opportunity to, to park on the street if need be. Sure. And, and the other thing that she mentioned was the 
a heavy flow of traffic at the intersection of Barbie and Herndon, uh, but she didn't mention anything about the proposed roundabout. Uh, is how close are we to that uh, at this point? Yeah. The uh, the contractor was uh, waiting basically for school to close or for the end of summer, so they should be charging ahead uh, any day now, um, starting with their work and. Uh, they have a completion date of August 15th before school goes back in the in the session. So yeah, I see um, that the initial work has begun yeah. with the um, yeah. dealing with the uh, <laughs> issues. Uh, this is not far from my neighborhood. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the narrowness of that street and the flow of traffic, uh, not only for um, um, solid waste vehicles, but also particularly emergency vehicles that may have to come through. Um, is there any concern about the fact that that narrow street, um, if that's the only entrance and exit for this development, um, what kind of impact would it have on emergency vehicles? Yeah. Well, as I indicated, we, we do work with the uh, upon request of either the, the fire department or even uh, Durham Public Schools if they're having difficulty with routing of uh, their vehicles. We'll notify the neighbors that, that we've had concerns. And um, if necessary, we can restrict parking on, on one or both sides of the road. We, like I said, we typically try to avoid doing that um, because if you build the street wider for to allow for on-street parking all the time and then the residents don't utilize it because they have two car driveways two car garages um, it can lead to increased speeds okay along the road, so. thank you very much mr. judge is that a 50-foot right-of-way typical subdivision cross yes section? the existing road meets our current standards 50 foot it's right away what's, what's typically in any new subdivision, subdivision. correct okay. recognize councilman Reese Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a question for our planning staff. <clears throat> if the council were to take the action uh, recommended by staff in the agenda item, um, the developer would be able to begin construction of 90 units on this property. Is that correct? Is there any other action that need to be taken by, by, uh, by the city council? Not by city council, Councilman Reeve. They'd have to file a final plat. Okay. Um, what's the significance of the site plan that's attached to the, is this represent a I'm a little bit confused about what they're committing to and what they're not um, I heard uh, mr. Wiggins suggest that there weren't there weren't we weren't they weren't allowed to have any um, committed elements and so that, um, can you help me under, understand? sure Be because this is not a development plan zoning this is a straight zoning uh, there's no legal ability legal ability for the council to accept commitments through the zoning process so in terms of proffers or, or other uh, anything that's attached is, is simply illustrative in that regard Thank you. That's what I heard. Uh, oh, I, I, Mr. Mayor, I did want to ask if, if you'll allow Ms. Eichelhart to respond to something that she heard. I think that's appropriate. Thank you very much. Um, so one thing I wanted to point out is Atkin Heights Boulevard is an existing road already to get to that property. Um, so I'm not sure how that all works, but um, we have 43 homes. Oh, pardon me. Could, could, could you this is up here? Oh. Could you repeat what you just said? Yes. So Atkins Height Boulevard is an existing road that leads to the property 301 Atkins Heights um, Boulevard. So there is a road directly from Fayetteville, as you can see on the map we drew, um, leading to the property as it exists. So our home is 43 homes, and they had mentioned, um, so if you add 43 homes to the 90 homes, and then he mentioned the neighborhood going in next to ours will have however many homes. So if you combine all of that, and then he's talking about adding possibly more neighborhoods to the south, that would mean those extra houses and cars would be coming through their neighborhood and then onto our street also. So yes, there would be another way out, but you'd still have to come down Marchery Road and go up one of our streets to get to Herndon Trace. So I don't see how that would be beneficial to anyone. Our streets are extremely narrow, um, and it has been a concern getting emergency vehicles down before. Um, so did you want to say something? Oh, I just want to clarify. Oh, that it's go ahead. A, it's a street, that, it's a dirt street, so you can actually drive 
down all the way to the horse farm that's there. And that's Can you speak into the mic microphone, oh, please? Sorry. Uh, just to clarify what Jessica said, uh, it's a dirt street that, that's used by the people who own that horse farm. So you can drive down it, and we have to see the condition of the street, and it's, it's drivable. So it's not like it's un, you know, paved. It's, oh, well, it's not unpaved, but it's not like it's just trees there that you can't even access it. It is an existing street, although not city street. <laughs> um, the other point I was going to make is like Fairfield has a lot of connected neighborhoods that have come together, but they have much wider streets than we do. Um, so to have all this traffic come down that one small street, Marchy Road, I think is really um, unrealistic and unfair to request of our neighborhood and our children and our families. So. Oh. Mr. Mayor, I had a question to the staff again. I'm sorry. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ms. Aghart. Um, I noticed there was some, some time spent in the staff memo on um, the question of donut holes. Um, can you, I noticed one of them seemed, I don't know, especially large to me, um, 294. Um, anyway, it seemed somewhat large. Do you, can you talk about um, the general, some of the div some of the planning concerns uh, and other concerns that arise out of the creation of donut holes, number one. And number two, can you talk about how th these two donut holes rate in terms of other ones that currently exist uh, where portions of the county are subsumed inside the city? Sure. Thank you, Councilman Maurice. Yes, as you indicated, uh, there would be uh, a large donut hole created to the north here uh, with the sanitization. However, with the change uh, in 2011 to this, uh, by the North Carolina General Assembly to the annexation law, uh, which essentially eliminated the ability of local government to do involuntary annexation. We, we really are gonna rely on voluntary annexation requests like the one you have before you tonight to fill that donut hill, hole in over time. But um, anytime there's a donut hole, there are concerns about service delivery uh, in terms of um, you know police response, fire response, uh, making sure adequate, appropriate services are provided um, in the city jurisdiction versus a county jurisdiction. Uh, was something we just wanted to make sure we pointed out to you, but uh, really there's no viable alternative other than this entire property coming in as a common plan of development in the future to, to pre prevent the, op the possibility of a donut hole. Well, I guess the other alternative is that we don't annex it, correct? Sure. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, may, may I add a point of clarification um, to a my early response to Council Member Shul and then to the, some of the comments that the, the citizens made to make sure the information is clear. Um, there, there is an existing uh, roadway connection from Fayetteville across the creek onto this property to the existing horse farm and there's two or three residential properties. Um, what I was trying to say earlier and I think maybe I did a poor job was when this property is developed under the current, current ordinance standards, we would require a connection both to Atkin Heights and to Marchery Road because the ordinance requires that we coordinate the, the um, roadway system and the infrastructure system. What I was trying to suggest was, uh, and what the applicant indicated is, there is a provision in the ordinance that allows you to request uh, variation from that requirement if there are significant environmental features. And there is a significant floodplain and a significant stream crossing that even though there's an existing crossing would have to be significantly enhanced. There, the existing culvert would have to be replaced. There'd have to be work in the creek bed. They'd have to increase the width of that uh, crossing. So that's something that is uh, possible to do, but that the ordinance would allow them to request to get out of because of the environmental impact of that. Um, Marchery Road doesn't have any environmental impacts. The only way we could um, relieve any developer of this property from that connection requirement is if they close the end of Marchery Road and and put in a, a hammerhead or a cul-de-sac bulb or something that would uh, eliminate the connection. I just want to make sure that point was clear for your considerations. Thank you. Recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had a couple of questions for staff. Um, so would the, would higher residential be able to build the requested number of homes in the zoning that's requested? Does RR zoning allow them to build what's being asked or do they have to come back for more zoning? Uh, that's a very good question. Councilman Johnson, I asked staff to look at that earlier. Um, under the county jurisdiction, if they were willing to develop on well and septic tanks, uh, they could develop the property. Um, they, it's very unlikely with the quality of the soils out there that they'd be able to get adequate um, percolation capacity for septic tanks to get this number of units 
on this property, it would probably be significantly less. It it's very difficult to estimate how many without doing on-site tests, probably in the range of 40 to 50 units. But they could do that by right, by just coming to the planning department and filing a plat. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, but if they're annexed into the city, they're able to build 90 units? Correct. And okay. that's because of the water sewer capacity and the, um, the number of connections they could get off that access point, which is one other point of clarification I'll make. Any additional units to the south would have to provide either a, a point, a, a step out to Herndon or over to Fayetteville. So there could be no, no more additional units added to the 90 without an additional connection point. Okay, and are the, is Marchery Road narrower than usual? I don't believe so. I'll ask Mr. Judge to address that. Um, no, we do have different street widths depending on whether or not we anticipate significant amounts of on-street parking or not, but it, it does meet our, our current street standards. Okay, thank you. I recognize Councilman Mark. Yeah, Mr. Judge, I'm sorry, I was looking at my iPad at the time. I think you mentioned the width of the cross section of the, the not the, no, I, I'm, I'm the street cross section. For Marchery Road? Yes. Um, it's a 50 foot right of way and I believe it's probably 27 feet back to back. It's either 27 or 25 feet back to back. But and, and how does that compare to, um, say, West Club Boulevard? Um, that Oval Park, well, Oval Park, of course, has a median in the middle of it, but, you know, yeah. just off Oval Park, do you know? Um, I'm not exactly certain of the street width, but, I mean, a 27-foot back-to-back, uh, basically, um, you would subtract out four feet for the, for the curb and gutter. That would leave 23 feet of asphalt, which would be about, uh, yeah, 11 and a half foot lane in each direction. With no parking? With no parking. Right. There. So if I think about 9th Street, for example, yeah. which carries a lot of cars, but that must be more closer to a 45-foot curb yes, to curb. Yes, correct. Right, OK. Yeah. Um, OK, um, I thank you. I have a question for a planning department. Um, one of the things, I was more interested in the second donut hole. The, um, one of the comments that you made was that uh, you all did a little bit of research and determined it looks like there was a survey error, and uh, but that the applicant refused to amend their zoning application. I mean, is that? Yeah, do I Jake, have that right? Yeah, Jacob Wiggins, the planning department. Yeah, it, the applicant indicated um, an apparent deed gap that they had found um, as part of the survey. We checked with Durham County Land Records. Uh, Durham County and Land Records felt that it was something that was not a deed gap, and the applicant probably had the authority to annex this area if they want to. And then we as staff relayed that information to the applicant. Can, can I get a, a, a representative of the applicant right, to just address why you didn't want to include the, now we have a little sliver that's going to be out in the middle of No, I understand. We, we do a lot of title research as part of our due diligence and all the surveys to match both the title research and the survey up with this. I'm Bob Anderson with Pulte, I'm sorry. Um, and unfortunately, whenever that deed was transferred over to Mr. Hire 30 some years ago, there, we found that there was a gap between surveys, which is typical, you know, during property development, but we can't, Mr. Hire doesn't own the property to give to us under our contract to then annex it. So, you know, that little sliver, I mean, if we could do it, we would put it in there, but if, according to our title and our Alta, we, Mr. Hire does not own that sliver, or it was not deeded to him correctly whenever he received the property or purchased it. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask it's you a little- It's not that we don't wanna, we're not trying to create a donut hole. It's, we don't feel that we have the legal ability to, to put that into it. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, I, I wanted to ask you, to compare, I, I'm interested in this and the one that just came before this because in a sense they have some similarities. There's an adjacent neighborhood. The development will have to use the adjacent neighborhood for access. And they talked about um, that they, they put an age restriction on in order to re um, limit the number of, of daily trips. They talked about where they placed the, the, the units. They talked about building a turnaround for large vehicles. Um, they talked about leaving a place to the driveway to the main road. Can you compare all that? Like, what are the, did, did you all work on, what, uh, what things have you all done to mitigate the traffic impacts on your neighboring community? Well, we approached this site originally because of the floodplains and the uh, environmental uh, features on the site. 
Uh, so by using the conservation zoning and preserving 50% of the site, um, that's how we originally you know, looked at this piece of property. Um, again, crossing over there and getting Atkins Heights and getting that to work out, we just didn't feel it was feasible. We knew there was going to be another access point on Hairton Trace coming north, and if anybody was to connect onto our property to the south, they would have to get an additional access point uh, onto Herndon Drive. I don't know how to. I don't have. I don't know anything about the case before you except for what I've heard tonight. So I don't. I'm not right, prepared right. to make a comparison. Yeah, you, you, no, that's okay. That's fine. Let but me we, ask a question at, this way: yeah. What have you all done to mitigate the traffic impacts on the neighboring community? Uh, for, well, well, we just minimize the density of the project to two units an acre, which is. I thought low. you maximized it the number of units well, you could have for a single connection. It's okay. Well, I'm, there's 90 units proposed. Um, there's no townhouses. This is all single-family detached. Um, that's, that's where we're at. Okay. Let me look here just for a minute. Okay, um, so thank you. I, I have a question for, I'm not sure who in staff, but um, the applicant has said that they believe that there's no practical alternative uh, excuse me, that uh, to build to, to build out Atkins Heights would require them to do a no practical alternative study and that that practical alternative, no practical alternative study would indicate that they would have to do exactly what they're doing. And I realize that study hasn't been done. My question is, using your judgment based on your professional experience, are they, is that likely to be true? Uh, Council Member Moffitt, uh, Pat Young again with the Planning Department. The no practical alternatives analysis or MPAA that the applicant referred to it is an analysis that's done anytime there's an encroachment or a crossing of a, of a stream. And really what, what it is is an assessment that whatever's being done, a crossing or an, or an encroachment by a roadway, that it's being done with a minimal, uh, pr man, minimal practical impact uh, on the environment. So really what it is is an assessment that the techniques, practices, specifications being used are being done in a way uh, that has the least possible impact on the environment. I'm very confident that it would be approved as long as high quality practices were used in installing a culvert or roadway crossing at that creek. I'm sorry, so did you, I'm gonna ask you to repeat that. Did you just say that you are confident that if they wanted to do a connection on Akin Heights, it would be approved? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanna comment that the that I observe a difference between the applicants, um, and that is, is that, that one applicant, the first applicant, the one we have just fund up approving, are people who worked with the neighboring community, who worked to address their issues, who came back, um, they went through the planning commission, unlike this one, but they returned to the planning commission with additional commitments in order to address the concerns of the neighbors. And, and um, I, I'm, it's frustrating to me that um, that the the first of all, I mean, I realize that this is really a, a petition for annexation and a and a, a utility extension agreement, not a rezoning per se. But it's ex it's frustrating to me that the applicant treats the adjoining neighborhood as more of an annoyance that has to be dealt with than a, a neighboring community that is part of the fabric of what they're building as well. And um, so that's all my comments for now. I, I'm gonna be voting against this, this item. Um, and I, I share the, the residents' comments relative to the traffic. Um, I, I, I know the area fairly well. Uh, I don't live too far from it. Uh, but I do think there's something to be said in terms of the existing traffic uh, the, tra the, the, the traffic will be generated on, on the streets that are coming in there. Uh, I, I would have preferred to seen the street close and somehow the development exit on Atkins Heights Boulevard, notwithstanding what I, we've been told that the issues are, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. Uh, I'm not supportive of creating this type of a donut hole in this part of the community based on what else we have there. So I, I appreciate the comments, the conversations. I, I know that uh, a lot of time has been spent on this, both at the staff level, the developer level, and the neighborhood level, but I'll, I'll, I'll be voting against this item. Uh, are there other comments or questions before I close? Uh, 
Let, let me say this. I asked early on, was there anyone that wanted to speak? And no, 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 one, no one responded. And I, cl I closed the public hearing. Thank you. Is there anything else on the side? I recognize Councilman Moffitt. One of the things that we've said before is that, um, that all of the easy development property in Durham County has been developed. We recognize that there are, that this is a challenging piece of property. But these kinds of developments, with this council, I believe that for, to develop these kinds of products is going to require working with the community and with the neighbors a little more closely than we have seen. And um, that is part of the challenge. I think that if this project came back, I'm, I'm, I have a somewhat similar position as the mayor, somewhat slightly different. I don't mind the connection to Marchery if there's a connection out to Fayetteville Road on Atkins Heights. I recognize the need for having connectivity. But funneling all of these homes down that one residential street, in my mind, is not appropriate. So I'll be voting against it, too. Recognize count. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So let's say, um, Mr. Young or Mr. Judge, I'm not sure who the right person here is, that um, this developer wanted to uh, extend out through Atkins Heights Boulevard. What would have to happen to make that happen? Yeah, as uh, Mr. Young indicated before, it is an existing uh, right of way, and there is an existing uh, gravel roadway and culvert within that right of way, but it's not currently maintained by either the City of Durham or NCDOT. So they, they would need to improve it to a public street standard, which would require basically widening the roadway and potentially acquiring additional right-of-way, because I believe the existing right-of-way is not more than about 30 feet. So they would have to likely acquire additional right-of-way from one or more property owners to expand it to a 50-foot right-of-way and put in a standard City of Durham street, and as well as the culvert to, to get access to the rear portion of the property. If there are no further comments, I entertain a motion on the item. Uh, move to approve with, I move to approve with the intention of voting against it. Is there, it's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, they kept saying aye. Those opposed, nay, no. nay. I think that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we move to item 29, public hearing on the draft FY 2017-2018 annual action plan. Mayor Bell, members of council, Reginald Johnson, director of the Department of Community Development. This is the third public hearing on the annual action plan, and I will turn it over to Ms. Wilma Conyers to uh, outline the particulars for you. Ms. Conyers. Good evening, Mayor Bell and members of council. Wilmer Conyers, Federal Programs Coordinator. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive citizen comments on the 2017-2018 Annual Action Plan. The Annual Action Plan specifies how the City of Durham will address housing and community development needs through the use of Community Development Block Grant, known as CDBG, Home Investment Partnership, known as HOME, Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, known as HOPWA, and Emergency Solution Grants, known as ESG. According to the formula allocations released by HUD on June 14, 2017, the city expects to receive $1,798,016 in CDBG, $822,366 in home, consortium funds, $164,728 in ESG funds, and $335,316 in HOPWA funds. The recommended figures in the draft 2017-2018 annual action plan will be revised to align with the publish, published entitlement amounts. The draft annual action plan was made available from May 19th, 
2017 through June 19, 2017. Notice of this meeting was advertised in the CAPASA, Herald Sun, and the Carolina Times newspapers on May 18th, May 19th, and May 20th, respectively, and also via general listserv. As a recipient of CDBG, HOME, ESG, and HOPWA funds, the city is required to hold at least two public hearings. This is the third public hearing. The first public hearing was held on community development needs on January 17th, 2017, and the second public hearing was held on June 5th, 2017. An application workshop and release of the application for the subject entitlement funds took place on December 6, 2016. The application submission deadline was January 24th, 2017. In accordance with HUD guidance, the city will need to submit the annual action plan no later than August 16th, 2017. A summary of these comments from this public hearing and written comments received during the development of the annual action plan will be incorporated into the final plan. In, cl in closing, we will ask later on the agenda that the Council approve the draft 2017-2018 annual action plan. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Uh, the public hearing is open. I would ask other questions by members of the Council on the staff report. Any questions? I don't have anyone that has signed up to speak on this public hearing item, but let me ask, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item this is in a public hearing? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the audience asked to speak on this item, this item being a public hearing. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. As a matter of fact, before the council. Yes, recognize. Yes, I council just wanted to Mark. comment that the, the issues here are very important, but this is the third public hearing that we've held. We have had comments from citizens on this, and um, I know they've been incorporated into the action plan, so I'm, I'm prepared to uh, move the approval of the 2017-2018 annual action plan. It's been properly moved and second. Further discussion? Hearing and call to question. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Does that, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Moffitt, does that include the ordinances also? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're moving to item 30. Public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding six previously ordered petition utility improvements. Uh, we held this item open. Uh, we've had uh, this item was presented at the work session, and it's now back before us for consideration. Uh, I don't know if the staff has any comments. I have several people that want to speak on this item. Does the staff have any comments you want to make before? Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, members of Council, Marvin Williams with the Department of Public Works. We are essentially here to answer any questions that you have regarding this item uh, based on the information that we have provided to you in the follow-up memo that we discussed at work session. So staff is prepared to address any questions that you may have or residents may have. Let, let me uh, proceed now. The, the sign-ups, I guess people are speaking for their individual projects, it appears. Although I do have someone who has item 30. I have people who signed up for item 30, item 1, item 30, item 2, item 30, item 6. So let me, I'm going to allow three minutes for each person. Let me call the item person who signed up for item 30. Uh, and if you state your name and address, is John McLean, is that correct? Come to the podium. Just restate your name and address, please, for the record. Great. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jonathan McLean. Um, I am the vice president of the HOA board with. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, let me say thank you first for having us. Um, I appreciate your time today. Um, specifically, I'm representing the Ravenstone community. Um, Currently, I, I understand this isn't in reference to our community directly. However, um, the proceedings of this decision does um, adversely affect our community, potentially. 
Um, and so with that, I would like to go ahead and first highlight all of the residents who decided to stay here since the beginning of this city council meeting, please, if the residents of Ravenstone can stand. Thank you. So that in specific, I wanted to call out the um, amount of attention that our community wants to be focused with this. Um, currently, if you all are not aware, within the Ravenstone Stonehill Estates um, street paving projects, we've been um, told that we will be specially, special assessed um, some number of money. And so what we're looking to at least discuss with the council, with you, Mayor, is um, the idea to um, rescind on these other um, utility repairs or such. And we ask you to first come back down to our community um, as we have been actively paying you know, taxes for the last decade, which with an average of about um, you know, three thousand dollars per house per household per year, around three hundred households, equates to about nine million dollars of taxes paid back into the city. Um, we would ask for the city um, council here to just reassess their decisions and to um, reinvest those funds back into the Ravenstone community um, or communities such as ours. Not necessarily only ours. Stonehill Estates suffer the same, um, you know, issues that we have had but I represent Ravenstone. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, let me make sure I, I, I'm clear about what this uh, is a question of whether or not we rescind. Correct. Propose. Correct. And what you sign up in opposition, so you don't want us to rescind? No, I do. I would like you to rescind. OK, well, I you, am sorry you, you, for sign up, you sign up as opposed to it. That's what I want to understand. Yes. Sorry. Okay. It is to oppose such. Or to approve. I, I support. Support. What? What? No. What is he saying? Are you, are you supporting the sense? Yes. Okay. All right. Ask my question, Mr. All right. Sure. I just want to make sure I understand. Yes. You and your neighbors are here. And by the way, thanks for sticking around to this point in the evening. Um, I think the folks who are here about the rescission were at an even longer meeting two weeks ago, so I think they've got got dibs on you there. So, <laughs> so am I to understand that, that you saw this item on our agenda and organized your neighbors to come down here to argue that? these other folks should not have the, their utilities extended? Is that, am I, is, am I, am I right in, in sensing that? In a sense, that's, that's slightly accurate. However, in a how, how, Okay, please help me understand. Well, in, in a different view, the, what I'm trying to put in a perspective into the city council here is that we have been actively paying funds in the last 10 years as a community, but yet we're still being specially assessed funds as we now promote other funding outside of such. Do you understand what I'm trying to convey? Um, I, I, I heard your presentation. I mean, I'm, I was here. I, I heard it. I'm trying not to be come, come off as aggressive any type of way. I'm sorry if I am. Um, but it's essentially that we're still looking to be specially assessed as a community, even though these projects are coming through um, for um, other developments that are outside of Ravenstone. And I apologize for any com confusion or, or stepping, shoot, you know, jumping the gun. Oh, I, I'm not confused. I, I just wanted to make sure I understood. So that's, so I got it right. You heard about this. This was on our agenda. And you and your neighbors decided to come down here and say, these folks shouldn't have the utilities ex extended, right? We wanted to show our support for the Ravenstone community and for the city to represent the Ravenstone community first and foremost, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, let me, uh, I'm sorry, I rec recognize Councilwoman Johnson. I'm sorry, I'm still a little confused. I'm so, sorry about that. <laughs> so your, your neighborhood is not one of the neighborhoods that's being considered tonight? Correct, we, okay. are, in, we are a, a separate neighborhood. Okay, but you're asking, is there, is there something that you're asking us to do for your neighborhood? Are you saying we shouldn't do this because we should be doing something for y'all instead? We want. I'm, I'm just here representing Ravenstone neighborhood to say that there's some funding being allocated by the city council um, outside of that for Ravenstone and our um, neighboring communities. Okay. I, I think I'm confused because like we allocate money for stuff all the time. Are, do you, are you asking for something specific? Okay. I, I, 
Specifically, I'm just here to voice Ravenstone's concerns with the um, potential for these um, for these hearing or for these improvements. Right. Okay. So I, I am in agreement with rescinding these, and I'm sorry for that confusion. Okay. That's Council okay. So let, let me try. For the two newest members of council who were not here <laughs> when the Ravenstone and Stonehill Estates issue came up. The, um, when they were um, when they were annexed into the city, their stormwater facilities and their streets were not accepted by the city because they were not improved adequately. The developer failed. The developer did not um, complete the infrastructure that was required to be completed. Uh, this issue is also dragged on, much like these uh, utility agreements. And um, we finally got to a case and. Robert, I'm going to ask you if you know off the top of your head, but what we did about a two, well, about two years ago was to agree to, we finally got to, um, Mr. O'Toole finally got us to a place where we uh, were able, we had a legal case that dragged on for years having to do with the bonding, and we finally got to a place where we said, okay, we're going to develop, we're going to do, um, improve the streets, improve the stormwater treatment, and we're going to assess the people who live in Ravenstone and Stonehill Estates. And it's several million dollars, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And, and, and I think that what they're here tonight saying is, look, you guys are you're charging us several million dollars to fix our streets and our stormwater. And, and we are neighbors adjacent to the, the, the utility extensions that, that, that people are asking for tonight that are outside the city. And that's why they're talking about millions of dollars and where it's going and investing in our neighborhood. So that's sort of the backstory for what it's worth. I don't know if that reduces any of the, or helps, but that's the backstory. And I'm just trying to make it a little more clear. I, I appreciate the backstory. I actually uh, did my homework a little bit about Ravenstone back when I first came on the council and, and learned a little bit about that. I guess I was just taken aback um, that y'all were here to talk about that um, in the context of your neighbors um, who are here for a different reason. So, I, and I, I don't, you know, I just was surprised and wanted to make sure I understood why you were here. I, there's no, no real confusion. I just wanted to make sure I was right, and, and I was. So, thanks for clearing it up. Thank you. Let's move on to the speakers that have signed up. Uh, Terry Jones. Is Terry Jones present? Uh, David Furr, F U R R. Uh, Alfred. Eisner, is Alfred Eisner present? Uh, Kelly, is that King, Kevin? Uh, Skip Couch. Uh, let me stop there. They're the ones that have signed up to speak for uh, item one on this, this area. Uh, and Craig Morrison is signed up. Is Craig around? Let, let me go to you first, because you signed for 30. You didn't sign up for a specific look. So you, you're speaking for item one also? Okay. All right, if you can just state your name and address, please. Good evening, Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council, staff. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is David Furr. I'm director of the Water Sewer Division of the Public Staff at the North Carolina Utilities Commission. We're here to talk about the uh, first of the six projects on your list there, it's the Red Coach, Grand Oaks area. I'm going to ask you to speak a little bit more into the microphone okay. also. I'm sorry. Uh, most of these people are on a sewer system serving approximately 14 residents in the Grand Oaks area, and there's one or more lots that are, have a failing septic system. The original developer, owner of the wastewater treatment plant there, abandoned the system many years ago. In March of 1993, uh, the ORC resigned. The power term was terminated for non-payment. Uh, Department of Environmental Quality stepped in and made system operational emergency funds available to get the system going again. Uh, in August of 1983, the Utilities Commission appointed an emergency operator for the facility. In 2002, discussions with the city of Durham began to see about connecting these people onto the city of Durham. Uh, the 
residents put together their petition in 2007 and the council approved that petition in 2007. Um, currently, Department Division of Water Quality uh, and their inspections are continuing to request that the connection to Durham be made and that there are system improvements needed to bring the system into compliance. Uh, customers' current sewer bills are about $112 per month, flat rate. We're currently on our fourth emergency operator, and the current EO has notified the public staff that he is resigning at the end of the month. The public staff is currently working to try to find another emergency operator. Residents in this area need this sewer service from the city of Durham and have been working for over 10 years to make this happen. This is still in their best interest. It's in the best interest of the environment. And if this doesn't happen, this connection to the city of Durham, a homeowner association will have to be eventually formed to somehow take ownership of this wastewater treatment plant, one that probably is not qualified to operate a wastewater treatment plant. Significant improvements, if not a total replacement of the plant, will be necessary. The resulting system will still not be economically feasible. The cost just to do the standard operation with no significant repairs or recovering the cost of the plant will be extremely high. And we'll have an unnecessary sewer discharge in Durham County on the edge of the city. I'm here on behalf of these customers to ask that this project continue. That's all I have. I'm available to answer any questions. Mr. Peters. I recognize Councilman Reese and Councilman. Mr. Furr, well, can you just. Let, let me, Councilman Reese. You did raise your hand, right? I did. Uh, Reese, uh, Shul, Johnson, and Moffin in that order. Can you just satisfy my curiosity? Um, I've never heard of a state employee come before a local board to advocate for a particular matter in this way. Is this something you do all the time as a part of your job? I'm just curious how that works. The public staff represents the, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the public staff represents the using consuming public before the North Carolina Utilities Commission. Uh, the commission has an emergency, has had several, and has an emergency operator assigned to this sewer treatment plant. And in an effort to resolve the emergency, we get involved with trying to make this, get the solutions to the problems. And the solution to this one has been for some time to get these people connected to the city of Durham. Mr. Fur, I don't want to belabor this, but I, you didn't actually answer my question. I'm is sorry. this something you do frequently, go before local no, governing boards and advocate I, for a particular action? I have not, no. So this is the I'm first sure. time you've ever done this? It's the first time I've done this, yes. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, I did not answer your question directly. Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, sir. The, um, you're only here concerning Red Coach and Grand Oaks, is that right, in terms of these rescissions? That is correct. That's the only one I'm familiar with. Um, so I'm just looking at our staff's analysis of the situation, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes, sir. Uh, NC Diener would allow for a new package plant to replace existing package plant with a new permit for the following conditions. Homeowners would need to formally create a homeowner association, become the responsible owner of record, so forth. Uh, this would cost approximately $300,000 to obtain a permit with NC Diener, buy a new plant, install the plant, and set up operations. This is based on an informal estimate by a local company who supplies these types of package plants. Staff, staff recommends this as a least cost alternative. I'm comparing that $300,000 to do that to what this would cost, according to our staff, which is $300,000 to the existing homeowners in Red Coach and Grand Oaks subdivision, and almost $800,000 additional to the Durham taxpayer. So can you speak to that, or do you have any thoughts about okay. why this would be better than that? I understand your observation, uh, and I will be the first to admit the upfront cost. It sounds like that's the better alternative, but what it costs to operate this treatment plant versus what City of Durham can provide the service for is a huge difference. Um, again, I mentioned the $112 flat rate now. I anticipate that's going to go up significantly in the near future, and that doesn't even cover any 
significant cost of any repairs. That's just if the plant operates routinely with no problems. Um, over the next several years, the cost, the economic cost to going to the city of Durham would be much better than having a sewer treatment plant out there. For the folks who are there? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So it seems like the reason that the North Carolina Utilities Commission would want us to, to continue this project is that it is now costing the Utilities Commission money to run this plant. Is that the case? No, the Utilities Commission is not paying, does not own this plant, is not running this plant. They have okay. assigned the emergency operator. So who's paying for that? The customers the are, are paying, paying for, for it, for okay. the emergency operator. And, and so you believe that it'll cost them less in the long term if we do this rather than what Councilman Schultz suggested, the, the formation of the um, HOA to run the plant? It, it will cost these customers It'll be in their best economic interest and the environment's best interest that we okay. connect these people to the city of Durham. What's I, the I, Utilities Commission's interest? I'm not, I'm unclear of why, why you're arguing for this, you personally, in your capacity as a representative of the Utilities Commission. Well, we have a sewer utility with real, no real owner. Uh, he's abandoned the property. There is no real owner of this sewer utility system. There's no one to actually put up the cost and, and make the improvements for a, a wastewater treatment plant. These people don't even own this plant. Uh, the, the option that's being discussed is for them to go in and replace the plant. They don't own the existing plant. They don't own the existing real estate that the plant is owned. Yeah, so I understand why it's bad for them. I don't understand why it's bad for you. The util again, I'm with the public staff who represents uh -huh. the using and consuming public before the commission. I represent okay. these people before the commission. Okay. And I'm advocating for them here. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So, so what our staff has, has told us it, it would cost and increase costs above what we could assess based on our existing agreement is $432,000 that the taxpayers of the city of Durham would have to pay. So I'm, what I'm not clear is, it, it feels like this is a transfer from the city taxpayers to the folks that live in this community without much benefit to the city. Okay. I understand your concern. Um, when these people petitioned the city of Durham in 2007, based on the city of Durham's estimates and cost involved at the time, they, they agreed to pay for, through the assessment once the project was done, would have covered all the costs. Uh, I understand that cities you know, had other items that had higher priority that they needed, wanted to spend the money on at the time. And major cost of these in, increased costs is because the Department of Transportation has increased their requirements for road improvements. Uh, and items involved with construction of the project, which changed over the over that time period. Um, okay, thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. The, um, the one of the things I want to do, you've answered. You, it's the Utilities Commission. I was like, which which State Department is here? Do you know that? The, the big part of this problem is that NCDOT is actually layering on a tremendous amount of this cost. And uh, would the Utilities Commission be willing to intercede with NCDOT on behalf of these neighbors to, to get the cost? Re they're not, requiring the city, and I'm not exactly sure what the language here is, but to completely rebuild cross sections of these state roads in order to uh, put the utilities in. That's the, that's the major reason why these costs are so escalated. And so the question is, if this is would you be willing to intercede with NCDOT? At this point, it's my understanding that your staff has attempted to do so, and our involvement here, our knowledge of what was going on as far as this recension, and 
the emergency operator quit, uh, resigning on us has just happened here in the past month. Time hasn't permitted us to go there yet, but that is one of the things that we want to pursue. Say that one more time, that, that is one last of the things, statement. That's one of the things we would like to pursue is getting DOT to reevaluate what their additional requirements are. So you would talk to NCDOT about the situation here and the... I don't know what, you know, influence we could have, but to talk to them, yes. Okay. Um, because the biggest challenge I have is somewhat on, on the order of Council Member Johnson's, which is that... I mean, this is a very difficult situation, and I feel for every one of you. But the question is, is not, you know, we, you know, the, the best estimate about what it would cost at the time these were ordered, you know, was under a million dollars. Yes, NCDOT has increased the cost to three million dollars. The question is, who should bear the cost of that? And, and uh, so, as people speak, please convince me that the Durham City taxpayers should bear that cost. And um, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask a few questions. And I, I think um, Don has gotten to the real issue, which we all know why the costs are, it's because of what NCDOT is doing. But by the same token, I can't avoid the fact that for whatever reason, we didn't act any sooner than we did which caused the court, because when we decided to act, NCDOT had gotten into the act, and therefore the costs are up. So I think we bear a certain amount of responsibility just on our process and procedures in terms of what we say when someone signs a petition and we say we're going to extend water and sewer, and for whatever reason, we don't do it until later. And when we decided to do it, the costs have gone up because NCDOT had gotten into it. So I, I understand that's, that's, that's basically I think, think where we are. Uh, the other question that I would raise is all of these uh, properties are outside the city limits. All of them outside the city limits. And I don't know if we've given any consideration at all in terms of if those properties were annexed into the city limits, uh, what our position would be. Uh, I don't know if you size that. I know we just talked about this other project earlier where we didn't want to create donut holes. And uh, to a certain extent, we, we would be that but I see most of these are pretty much connected to this, are right adjacent to the city limits for, for a lot of these things. But did the staff give any consideration in terms of what uh, the cost would be if it were annexed, these properties were annexed? And then I'm going to get back to the NCDOT issue. Don O'Toole, the city attorney's office. Uh, Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, but I actually don't. I, I guess the first question would be, could all of the citizens get together and petition for annexation? Assuming they could, I don't think that really changes anything. There still isn't the water and sewer infrastructure there. So the two alternatives that they would have, which is what normal p developers do, they could enter into a utility extension agreement in which they could agree to extend the water and sewer, and they would bear the full cost. Or, once again, they could petition for annexation. The only difference is they would be inside the city. Well, let me tell you what the difference is. If they're inside the city, now they're starting to pay city taxes down the road. Now, true, we provide services, but for the long road, they're in the city. They're paying city taxes. Now, how long it would take to recoup that investment is a different issue, and that's why I asked had anyone looked at that. If, if they were inside the city paying city property taxes, what type of revenue would it bring in, and how would that revenue count over the long haul versus the investment we're speaking about? That specific issue has not been looked at by okay, staff, well, sir. That, 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 I think, is, is, is another piece. That you, and then it's up to the citizens to decide whether or not they want to choose annexation. The other piece is uh, I think it's fair for the Utilities Commission to go to the state of North Carolina Department of Transportation to explain the situation that we're now in and to see if there's any type of relief that they might be willing to assist us in providing the extension of these lines to to uh, to these residents. Uh, I think we owe ourselves to take that step. Uh, we're not going to, no matter what we do, we're not going to start extending water and sewer for the next week or next month or so. Uh, the people are where they are. The only only issue is that you've got a utility package plant that you've got to go find an operator for. 
and you find the operator, you already said that more likely than not, what they're paying now is going to be increased. They're paying $112 a month or whatever it is. If you get another operator based on where they are, they're going to have to pay a higher, higher uh, rate to keep getting the service that they're getting now. But that's, that's a different issue. But I do think it's some value to take time to go to the NCDOT to explain the situation we're in and then find out whether or not they're willing to consider it. I also think it's reasonable for the staff to come back and tell us uh, what would be the uh, revenue that the city would receive if these persons were annexed into the city and you take all the services we've got to provide, the police service and the garbage collection and all that stuff, what's the net revenue that we would, ha we would be able to see? over a period of time. And I know that property taxes don't support water and sewer. I understand that. Uh, that comes from fees and services. But it is additional revenue into our, into our, our general fund. Another source of funding, if we really wanted to do it, we could very easily go to the fund balance and take the money out to make it happen. I'm not saying that's what we do, but that's, that's their possibilities. But I think what, I, what I'd rather hear first is what it would take for and at, what would be the revenue if they were annexed and I'd like to see Utilities Commission go to the Department of Transportation to explain where we are and see what kind of relief we might be able to get on that. That's my comments, but we've got other speakers, and I, I would, would like to hear them also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alfred Eisner. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, thank you for your time. I'm just a little guy, I just a property owner on uh, Red Coach. And um, just like a month ago, I would like to express my uh, rejection of the idea of a city considering rescinding that commitment. I heard a lot of sentiment tonight about how city council is proud of its budget and how it's proud of uh, its commitment to provide to its citizens uh, services such as sewer and water. And I hope that uh, uh, this council can actually stand up to those commitments. I just have one little thing to bring to uh, council attention. When I was in the process of buying the property, 5610 Red Coach, we made a contact with uh, Mr. McHenry, who uh, at that time was a uh, engineering service supervisor. And he uh, wrote to us briefly that indeed this was petitioned and the public hearing did take place and the project was ordered on October 1st, 2007 and the project is now assigned to our WS84 contract. I of course don't know what that means but it means contract means contract, and it will probably not be built but for another two or three years, which I patiently waited. waited. Of course, it's many more years than that, passed since then. I think that just like uh, Mr. Mayor mentioned, that um, some responsibility needs to be shared for the fact that it was delayed. Obviously, there were other priorities. Uh, some of them I can argue about like parks and others, but there were bad weather, there were hurricanes, I don't know what, there were all this money that had to be spent, but um, right now we are facing the new situation, new costs, and I think it needs to be uh, spread between the city and state, and of course uh, the residents, I'm sure, are willing to pitch in, but uh, their abilities is limited. Thank you for your time. Kelly King, Kevin? King. King, okay. Michelle King, 5611 Red Coach Road. I kind of had an agenda, but I uh, kind of had an agenda, but after what's been said, I got to change it a little bit. I think uh, whatever y'all were reading about, about the condition of the sewer system, the cost to upgrade it, and what could be done, I'm afraid if you look back, it's 10 years old. That was 2007. So you're comparing all those numbers to 2017, and you're looking at a 10-year-old document. So 
all those repairs, costs, and things like that, you can, it's no good. It, those repairs wouldn't meet the restrictions of the state of North Carolina for 2017. They just barely would for 2007. So that could be rethought of or updated. But, but what y'all were reading, go ahead and look at it. If I'm wrong, tell me. It's 10 years old, though. What I was going to talk about, and I got a document here that says final, final resolution ordering to making a certain local improvements. And it's signed by the city clerk. It says approved by the city council October 1st, 2007, which is the final resolution that this neighborhood made with the city council 10 years ago. And it states a lot of things in here, but I think one thing, and Mayor Bell kind of brought it up, item F in here says that the work on said improvements as herein set forth, ordered and provided for, shall be commenced at once. That was October 1st, 2007. Commenced at once. This was out of R. Lee Murphy's office the first day of October. And said so the manager of engineering is hereby directed to cause a notice of order in the making of said improvements to be published. This was all 10 years ago. I, d I really don't know what the DOT situation with the street was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, this neighborhood came to you guys after we went to the state of North Carolina, after we went to Durham County, and after we tried to find an emergency operator for a sewer system that needs a licensed utility to operate it, which it does not have because no one knows who owns it. Nobody wants to buy it. Nobody wants to take it. Nobody wants to have responsibility to it. So when we came to y'all 10 years ago, we were out of ideas. So a lot of these ideas that have been kicked around this meeting and the other meeting, they've been kicked around 10 years ago. They were kicked around and kicked to the side. That's what made this agreement 10 years ago. And the only thing this, thank you. I, I, I appreciate your comments. I, again, I don't know what the cost of a package plan. I'm just going by what the staff person says. So I'm not looking at any numbers. He's just said that it would be more expensive He's in that business. I took his word for it. So I, I'm, not, I'm not doubting any figures, but I'm not looking at any reports that says what it's going to cost. I, I, but I got your point. Thank you. My, Thank my you. knowledge is I don't think you could replace the package system well, that's, legally. That's, that's what the Utilities Commission would decide because they're the ones that would have to approve it or not approve it. Um, Skip Couch. Skip Couch, uh, 1823 Grand Oaks Road. Um, you know, uh, you guys don't mind making an investment sometime or throwing some money at something sometime to enhance our property and enhance the folks of Durham. But I don't know, you know, this thing has been going on for a good hard 10 years when he said he was going to make the move on it. Um, it's about 15 houses in that, that's on this system. Uh, our average property tax with county taxes at per year is about three thousand dollars per house so if you do i don't have anything to add with or whatever you're looking at county taxes alone that'll be somewhere around fifty sixty thousand dollars uh per year in 10 years taxes um you're looking at six hundred thousand dollars just in county taxes alone. Now, if we'd, we'd been at annexed into the city back then, generally the taxes double. So if you double $600,000, that's about $1.2 million that someone would have been collecting since 2007 to make this, de this whole deal work. Folks, the people live in that, in that neighborhood they're not going anywhere. You're not going to lose any money. Sooner or later, the city and county is going to get all their money back. You have nothing to lose. This is a win-win situation. When it's paid off, 
It's nothing but pure profit right there. What in the world are you looking at? Pure profit. Thank you. I would just comment the county is not putting any money into this. You're really coming back for the city. County County's not putting any money in this. So any money that goes into it will come either from the city or from the state and the property owners. But the county, whatever, whatever taxes you're paying the county, they aren't investing in your water and sewer. But I understand your rationale. I understand. Thank you. All right. Uh, Craig Morrison. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Craig Morris, and I live at 1803 um, Grand Oaks Road. Ten years ago, we came and asked, you know, what could we do? We had been a lot of other places trying to find a solution. We got a description of what you could do. We were told, you will have to pay the bill. We said, okay, we'll pay the bill. And the numbers were calculated, the documents were created, and we all executed them and said, good, let's do it. And we're cautioned that, you know, we, it, would, it may take some time. Um, I don't believe uh, any sort of a plant or any other temporary treatment facility of any sort can be permitted in that, that bottom that it's in today. Uh, I think the only solution is municipal sewer. Um, and we'd really appreciate you figuring out a way to not terminate our, our progress, if we can call it that. Uh, for us to have to start all over again would be, um, would really be a bad thing. And I, I think it's an environmental issue. Um, I, I don't believe there's another plant to be permitted there. But that's, that's an opinion. Thank you. Is this Terry Jones? My, my name is Terry Jones, and my address is 5625 Red Coach Road. I want to thank Mayor Bell and the City Council for hearing our concerns this evening. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is, has been said before, but I just want to give you kind of an insight on our, just our unique situation here within the system. Um, this issue regarding our sewer system is very important to me my family, my neighbors, and Durham County. We bought our home 15 years ago in the Grand Oaks subdivision, and we also bought the premise that our present community sewer system was environmentally outdated and was about to be replaced with city services. This was 2002. We were told the EPA would also start levying fines because of this horrible situation. The former owners of our house inquired about this change. During our purchase negotiation, they placed funds into escrow to be used for this future project. We felt confident about the home we just purchased and the city would act accordingly. We waited five years and our homes were finally assessed for the project in 2007. I have all the very detailed documents and paperwork just like the other people do and individual homeowner costs that were given to us from the city planners that were gathered at taxpayer expense. We thought this was a great sign, then we waited. After 10 long years of waiting for this project to go through, houses on our street have sold, often taking a severe loss in value because of this delay. The remaining homeowners are still waiting for this project to take place. We've been counting on it. Now the clock ticks away on our outdated sewer system. It is not environmentally friendly. I wish you could see this system. It is on a sloping lot near a creek that flows into the Eno River. Who knows how much of this spray or whatever, it, it, however they treat the sewer is getting into Crystal Creek, which is in turn going right into the Eno. Our city and our county cherish the Eno River. Why let this continue? It's an outdated system and it cannot be replaced where it is. It's a horrible, smelly system. And it's unclear how the system affects the Eno watershed. As for selling our homes in the future, we have to disclose this problem and communicate that it's still in limbo. Not a great selling point when you're trying to retire into a smaller home. As citizens, we should be treated fairly as promised in this contract. 
we utilize Durham businesses and bolster the city's economy as if we were paying city taxes. We should have access to clean water and environmentally safe sewers, not failing wells, as some of these folks have, outdated septic tanks, or inefficient community sewage treatment, and broken city contracts. Please continue to push this project through. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, m most of the discussion so far has been persons who are being impacted because of the sewer. We've got people who are impacted because of the water. So I'm going to call these names, and I, Ms. Teresa Price, Sheila Eason, Andrew Shank Shankel. Is there anyone else that, anyone else whose name I haven't called? All right, Ms. Price. Mayor Bell, City Council, thank you. I'm so short, sorry. Thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to also say, since our last meeting, I've had more conversations and more information, actually in the last three days, than I have in 10 years, which is great. I wish I'd have gotten it 10 years ago. I know I caused a lot of confusion my last time up here, saying I had paid assessment fees. I've now been educated and I've learned a lot about the ordinance of the city. I've become actually very versed and I'm very glad to hear that you guys are considering revising um, code 70.17 about the temporary water service and the assessments charged for that and how it's handled because that's where my confusion came in. My property, as I explained last time, we, we followed all the process and, and to file a petition is, is a great, it's, it's not an easy process. For a citizen to file a petition, they're at their last resort. They've done everything else. Since I filed my petition, two of the neighbors that saw, signed the petition have passed away. They're no longer alive now to even see you know, that go through. So I just want to point out that there should be a time limit. When the city approves something and says it's, it's ordered, I, I, I hooked up to a neighbor's, I got a temporary easement. It was temporary, so if anything happens, it's temporary only. It can't be handed over to my family. I can't sell my home. I've turned down promotions, turned down opportunities to move because I can't sell my home, all because of this easement. When I got the easement 10 years ago, the city required that I started paying frontage fees. At the time, I didn't realize it was frontage fees. I thought I was going to pay them on the end when the project started. So after it didn't start for a year, I stopped. Well, you know, I, I know Robert has thick skin and has taken the beating from me. Um, and help me kind of start getting that straight with the frontage fee part. But I'm still in a process where I'm negotiating from a, a temporary easement, but it's still not going to fix the problem. I'm paying a cost, frontage fee cost of over $5,000 that I'm paying, that I've, I've paid already some and will pay, with, you know, unless something changes. And still I'm paying this fee and have no water. I'm hooked up to a temporary service that's not permanent that I can't do anything with. It was a requirement of the city that I pay these frontage fees in order to even get hooked up to the temporary situation. So, you know, I wasn't even allowed to get water without agreeing to pay the fines. And I do think, you know, potholes are important for the other residents, but not having water, not having a well is more important. And I did pay my assessment, or frontage fees, I'm sorry. Don't wanna cause that confusion again. So I just ask that you consider that. But even more importantly, our road is having a, a whole bridge taken out. And there's a whole, that whole construction piece with the concrete and the repaving. There's also another project, which I'm sorry, I wasn't aware of at the end of, that supports a community ball field at the end of Stallings Road that also got denied and petitioned 10 years ago. The sections in between was founded by the, the construction you know, developers but they're gonna to have to repave the road. I'm assuming since they're replacing an entire bridge on the road and our road's been shut down for three months. I'm assuming that the cost for the city from the repavement may be already there and this may be an opportunity for at least, if not for my mind, for the community ball field on, from Stallings to Husketh or Husketh to Patterson. Thank you. You're welcome. Sheila Eason.
while, while Ms. Season's coming forth, I will say, Ms. Price, I, I read your emails today and it sort of educated me also on this whole process of what you've gone through and what, what we were doing, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council members. My name is Sheila Eason. My address is 3325 Summerlin Road, which is a road that cuts off of East Gear Street in the area that number six addresses under item 30. The reason that I'm here tonight is to ask you to please not rescind your decision. For many years, my family has lived in this particular part of the community. My husband and I continue to live in this part of the community, and we were able recently, within the last two years, to buy some undeveloped property, which is in the area that's covered by number six. So that's why I'm here, is to ask you to please keep your promise to the citizens in this area. Um, when we were able to purchase this property, um, part of our negotiations in deciding upon the price was because the buyers told us that this was set up that there would be city sewer coming through there. Had we not known that, I'm sure that the price would not have been settled upon that we purchased it for, and we may not have even purchased it at all. Um, I can tell you because we've lived in that community that a number of years ago, my family, my husband and I, had perk testing done on our property, which is less than a quarter of a mile from this area, and we could not get a passing perk test. So the the undeveloped property that we have purchased on East Gear Street, I feel very strongly that it will not pass a perk test. And so we'll be just really stuck. And I know I'm just one person in this neighborhood, but I believe that when the promise was made that this would be, this extension would be done with the sewer, that it was definitely the intent of the council to go forward with it What's caused the delay, I certainly don't know. I was not at the last meeting in May, but I have gone online and listened to the comments. And a as Mr. Mayor said, we're not in the city. And I realize that. We're not paying city taxes. But that was known at the time that the promise was made, too. And we would ask, my family would ask, and others in our community, um, some of them are elderly people. Some of these homeowners have been there 20, 30, 40 years, and some of those folks can't come out and speak for themselves. So I'm speaking for the community and would ask you to please consider that strongly, that we would really appreciate if you all would keep your promise to us and go forward with this sewer extension. And thank you for Shankle. your time. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Yes, sir. Did every one of you get my email? I sent it to the mayor and the other six council members. I'm Andrew Shankle, 2919 East Gear Street, Durham, North Carolina, 27704. I think Steve Shul responded to that. Did the rest of you get that? I don't know if I got it or not. Okay, I just wondered because I want to recap some facts here. We started back in 1997. Mr. Shankle. Yes. You're going to have three minutes. Huh? You got three minutes. I know that. Okay. Could turn it back to three minutes. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Okay. We started this back in 1997. Residents were actually paid for linear footage for water and sewer. 2001, we got water all the way down to Red Mill Road. Okay. 2017, two uh, surveyors started marking for sewer. And understand when they put these sewer lines in, they put the water on one side and sewer on the other. They don't dig up the middle of the street anymore. Okay. Oh, the way y'all lump this together, all six at once, frankly, it's a little disturbing. These are individual proposals and projects. 
And as I said here, it's like a negative pork barrel. You know, it's not fair, but that's, you know, I guess that's status quo. Some of the neighborhoods a mile further than the Gear Street community, which is called Gorman, by the way, have water and sewer. Two are annexed. Cooksbury Drive is city out. They don't have, I mean, they do have water and sewer, but they're not in the city. And I think it actually may jump across over to Gorman Church. I'm not sure. But we got water, but Cooksbury has water and sewer a mile past that. Between Beck Road and Cooksbury Drive, they have water and sewer. Gorman in the middle does not. Okay. So, and yeah, as far as the DOT goes, I watched them with jackhammers out there. Gear Street's the old Highway 15. It was before the Eisenhower Road Project was put in, which Bob knows about. It's 14 inches thick of concrete and rebar with asphalt over top of it. You can run it on a bulldozer over all day and just put new asphalt down. So it's not going to hurt that road. It was handled, you know, unbelievable. Back in 2007, the Durham Planning Department, in regards to the Panther Creek Industrial Zoning, okay, they wanted to take three pieces of land right in Gorman and rezone them as industrial. Well, the first art of deception is misdirection. They had no, absolutely no reason to do that. The owners of the land didn't show up. All the other residents did, worried about them having big trucks and putting in industrial operations out there on top of us. And I stood up, I said, they're not doing that. It's low density residential, they want you to shoot this down so you can bring in medium density and start building these cracker box villages on top of us. My property value went down $10,000 this year. Don't know why, house looks good, should be going up you would think. Well what they did is um, <clears throat> eminent domain, drop the property values, come in there and take our homes because the septic systems don't perk anymore and we lose our homes. It's criminal. Unbelievable. 1997. One more thing, we're going to pursue this in federal court if you screw us again. Thank you. Is, is there anyone else that wants to uh, speak on this item? This, again, this public hearing. I'm, I'm not going to close the public hearing. Um, I still have some comments and discussion. Uh, one of the things I would ask the staff, and uh, to his point, I was going to ask that early on. These projects are separate. That's correct. Uh, they're separate. Yes, and I'm sir. not sure. Where does, is the state, has the state road caused all these problems? Do they have problems with all of them? I mean, I see the ones on, on Stalin's and Bangkok and the one he just talked about. These are all state roads. But I'm talking about the problem that we're having, that you're having this cost the increase. Yes, sir. Right. There, there's two specific okay. problems with NCDOT. One of them is the rebuild of the roads. And the second one is what they refer to as active shoring. And active shoring is a process whereby you, you put the uh, utility lines in and you have uh, basically special restrictions and uh, heavy plates that are placed in the road on either side as you dig the utility. It's a very expensive shoring system. And those additional requirements have been placed by DOT. And those are the things that add to the major portions of the cost. There are still pieces of the cost uh, that have increased over time uh, due to the length of the project when it was first looked at mm -hmm. and the time frame we're in now, 10 years later. So it's the shoring of these roads that is the big cost from the shoring, shoring, shoring and reconstruction, okay. yes, sir. All right. Recognize, did you hand up, have you hand up, Councilman Hill and Councilman Reese? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. So, um, Robert, um, th this is now kind of routine then with state DOT. That's just what they do. It's not these particular roads. That's just the way they're built now. That is correct. Yeah. It is a change in policy at the DOT level. And when did, when did that take place? I don't know the exact date of it. Uh, I believe it was a couple of, you know, like, I think the policy change was made a couple of years ago, ultimately. Uh, we start seeing things creep up. This is a standard policy that is followed, uh, in particular in the coastal portions. It was not adopted statewide 
uh, until uh, fairly recently. Okay. Let me ask you a question. The, the, um, the gentleman from the public staff, uh, uh, I guess I would say, has questioned whether or not having a, and sir, I'm, I'm going to put words in your mouth, and if I'm wrong, you can tell me. Uh, but, but my understanding is that he has questioned whether or not um, what we've listed here is option. He, he's here for the Red Coach and Grand Oak subdivision, as you know. Yes, sir. That whether or not uh, this would be feasible, this option one here that you have, that the, the uh, chain of permit with NC Diener, buy a plant, install the plant, set up operations, and that I, I, I think it would be fair to say that he's not sure this could be done and that it would be more expensive in the long run for these people, and he's saying a lot more expensive. Do you have any thoughts about that? So I contacted N.C. Diener, uh, the head of the unit who, who actually uh, uh, would approve the plans for this and uh, spoke with them directly. Uh, as this was permitted previously, it can be re-permitted. There are notable exceptions in this. Uh, and those include that there would need to be an owner, an HOA. They would have to uh, obtain the property, and they would have to form a, an HOA. And in the case of uh, Grand Oaks Red Coach, uh, they have covenants that were uh, adopted for their subdivision. But they were never, an LLC, the homeowners association was never formally created under the secretary of weight uh, secretary of state's website as a corporation so it would have to be incorporated obtain that property and they would be the permittee of record and then they would have to obtain a group like aqua uh, who would actually maintain the plant on their behalf and charge them for that Okay. But they would ultimately have to own and operate it. Okay. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'll just tell you where I'm at on this, which is uh, I think I'm not sure whether, you know, the, we ought to continue the public hearing or close the public hearing, how you want to do that and what's the appropriate thing to do. But I just think uh, we need to, uh, the, the, our folks and the folks in the public staff need to go see NCDOT and see what kind of relief we can get before we want to make a decision on uh, going forward with this. Um, uh, I, I, I just think that's a crucial part of this. And uh, given the situation we're in, the length of time that this has gone on, I can certainly understand the feelings of the, of the people out there. Um, on the other hand, uh, this is something that uh, has been thrust upon us by DOT. Uh, granted, it took a long time for us to get the job done, uh, but I would, I would like to have uh, find out about what the possibilities of them sharing this cost uh, before we would move forward to do the work. Who, who's Councilman Reese? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to thank the staff for putting together the additional information in the interim from our last uh, public from the first portion of the public hearing um, two weeks ago. Uh, I think it's helpful to clarify for us um, where the costs are coming from, how many uh, homes are located in each of the areas, et cetera. I appreciate that. Also, really appreciate you um, working with the one homeowner who emailed us. And by the way, I also over that, Ms. Price, I thought that was, you've been through quite a bit, and I'm glad that our staff is uh, working to help you kind of understand some of the issues um, involved in your temporary easement. Um, I also uh, want to uh, thank the, um, Mr. Furr, is it, from the Utilities Commission for providing us some additional information, specifically as it relates to um, the legal status of the treatment facility currently in operation, uh, the need for an, a, a new emergency operator, your, uh, I'm sure, quite good professional opinion about the cost associated with upgrading that facility or and operating it over time as compared to the um, to the extension of city services I would just um, you, you could your position here strikes me as incredibly odd um, and you've never done this before so I'm guessing it strikes you as incredibly odd too 
Um, and um, so I think, uh, in any event, I appreciate the factual and um, opinion, professional opinion based information you've put before us um, because I think that's important to know. Um, long story short, the city committed to extending utilities to these Durham County residents. The Durham residents waited for almost 10 years now for that to happen, and it is not. And in many cases, as they have told us, and in many cases we won't and can never hear, uh, these homeowners made decisions about their homes, their lives, uh, based on the assurance that the city gave them 10 years ago that uh, city services would be extended pursuant to, to the decision that this council made. The reasons for the delay are many and varied, um, and as are the reasons for the increased cost in doing what we said we would do 10 years ago. And I think I, I appreciate uh, my colleague Steve Shule's desire to go back to DOT and find out if we can get some kind of a waiver on the type of reconstruction that's going to need to be done in order to accomplish these extensions. I also appreciate the mayor uh, suggesting uh, that we look at the possibility of annexation, uh, although I know there are lots of complications and that that's a process um, unto itself. But ultimately, for, for me, uh, and again, this is nothing to, this is probably the most politically unpopular thing to do in the city of Durham, um, is to suggest that we spend, I don't know, uh, $2.152 million uh, on folks who don't live in the city and don't pay city taxes. But ultimately, for me, the question is um, the increase in cost from 2007 to 2017 um, is who is to bear the burden of that increase? Who, which entity made choices that created this situation? And I'm not asking for a staff's input, by the way. I'm just, I'm talking to myself. But you, you can stand where you want. I just saw you <laughs> moving up to the microphone. Um, that's not the portion of the, of the conversation I'm in right now. Um, which entity ought to bear the cost? It's not which entity can most easily bear the cost. It's not which entity is, is it politically um, popular for them to bear the cost. But from, from a moral perspective, like from a perspective of the right thing to do, which entity should bear the additional cost? Um, I don't personally believe it's these homeowners, even though if they were to apply today uh, for a utility extension agreement, they would pay far in excess of what um, they agreed to pay seven years ago. Um, that to me is completely immaterial. Um, the issue is what's the right thing to do? It's not popular cost us a lot of money, it's the right thing to do. We should do it. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to explore some of the other options. I totally get the fact that, oh, oh, I also wanted to say to the folks from Ravenstone, I appreciate your concern that the city council um, be good stewards of the city's money. And as city taxpayers, you have every right to be concerned about that. And I appreciate you being here tonight uh, to, to do that. I would just encourage you to get involved in the city budget process a lot earlier. We start in February with coffees with council. Um, you should come and see how we spend all of our money, not just $2 million to help uh, folks we agreed to help 10 years ago. So I um, encourage you to get involved a little earlier in the process because I think you'll get a lot out of it. Um, and uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about this, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Does anyone else have comments uh, on this item? If, if you have comments, I, you can make them now at the appropriate time. Okay, I'm, I'm not asking for comments. I just want to make sure people have the purpose. I, 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 unless I have some objection, I, I'm going to continue to hold the public hearing open. Uh, and I guess I need to do it to a date certain. I, I think we really ought to try to explore what possibilities there are with the North Carolina Department of Transportation relative to this issue. I would appreciate uh, if the staff from the Utilities Commission would be a part of that discussion. I would hope, Mr. Manager, that, that our staff could be a part of that discussion also relative to what, what, what's involved, what's been, what has occurred. Uh, I, I would also like to get a response to my question about what would be the revenue that the city would receive if these areas were annexed. Uh, and you, you do it the way you normally do it? Take, we can. Okay. As a, uh, sure. 
If I could, Mr. Mayor, uh, as you're thinking about this, um, I'd like to ask the city attorney's office for clarification. I'll defer to Patrick whether he, you know, is best to answer or Don O'Toole, who I know has been working on this. But it's my understanding that if the council is going to do anything different than exactly what was done when you ordered the improvements, whether that's annexation, a different financial model, whatever, you would have to do that by rescinding the order and then issuing a new order. You couldn't just amend this order. That's Could correct. somebody clarify? Yes, that is correct. You can't come up with some sort of hybrid or change the fee sharing structure today. Or you require annexation <laughs> or, or any of those kinds of things. I can, I mean, we certainly yeah. can get the information for you as a part of that consideration, but ultimately to do anything different than the order then the 2007 order would require rescinding to, to and rescinding then issuing and starting a new order. order. Yes. I, I understood that. Okay. I, just want to I be understood sure. that. But the question before us now is whether we rescind it or not. Right. Uh, if we choose not to rescind it, then it means we've got to go through and do what we say we're going to do right. and figure out where the money's going to come from. Right. So I'm, that's why I'm not saying re, I don't want to say don't rescind it right now because ultimately that might be what we end up coming back saying. After we've had discussions with DOT and we get some information about the annexation piece and all that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm straight on that. So let, let me, I, I want to put a timetable on this. Uh, when do we have our next meeting? I know we, is it in August, August or July? The 8th. August 8th. Or August the 7th, right? Okay, let, let's, let's, let's do it. Well, when do we have our first work session in, in August? July 27th. No, in August. Oh, August. I want to give people enough time to really look at this. So if we could bring it back to our work session, the, the first, first work session in August. The first work session in August, yeah. August 10th. Okay. Bring it, bring it back then, and hopefully you will have had time to have those discussions and ask some of the questions that we have. Okay. So, so to be clear, that we would be continuing the public hearing if it was at that August 10th work session, the public hearing would be August 21st. Yeah. I recognize Councilman Shule. Just wanted to check in with the uh, gentleman from the public staff. Uh, are you on board with the idea of trying to work with the DOT to get them to uh, work with us here? I'm sure we're willing to have discussions with different parties all across the spectrum. Okay. And um, I wasn't clear exactly the extent to which you've been talking to our staff about this previously. I know you probably didn't just show up here at our work session for the first time without that. So you're in good communication with, with uh, Mr. Joyner and so we, forth? I've been in good communication with Mr. Joyner. I thank Mr. Joyner for all the information that he's shared with us. Uh, he's doing an excellent job. He always does. So thank you. Well, let me ask you, I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, state has a stake in this, package plants located in the county. If there wasn't a municipality located nearby, what would happen? I mean, you're, you're coming and asking us to foot the bill to fix the problem that, that the neighbors have, the state has, the county has. I'm just curious about what would happen if there was no municipality, no, no, what, what solution would the state be pursuing? in the absence of a nearby... Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I can't answer that question. We have some emergency operators around the state that I would call it a perpetual emergency operator. Each one is, has its own specific set of issues. Um, this particular one, the customer base is so small that their rates are, gonna, are just gonna be outrageous. Um, in my world, uh, the utilities that the Utilities Commission regulates in the water, water sewer is typically small community systems or in the case of something like Aqua North Carolina is a conglomeration of a huge number of them spread all over the place. The economies of scale are just poor yeah. and that's why their rates are always higher. And when you have a sewer operation like these people have, it's really bad. I'm, I don't know that I even answered your question, but it's not a good situation. Okay, okay uh, 
Is it any other item to come before the council? If not, we're adjourned at 10:16 p.m. Thank you.